Welcome to another earth-shaking, record-breaking, and burger-embracing episode of What Happened, the show that chronicles video games, movies, and media with disastrous development cycles. So, uh, let's get started! Most should be familiar with Monolith Soft, the Washington State studio responsible for such classics as Blood, Septeracore, and the Fear franchise, among many others. Established in... God damn it! Tokyo-based developer responsible for Xenosaga, Baton Kaitos, and those Project X Namco games that everybody wants, but nobody actually plays. Now, while Monolosoft started working almost exclusively under Namco, that relationship gradually dissolved after the retirement of then Namco CEO Masaya Nakamura in 2002. This was due to the eternal structure of the mega publisher changing drastically once it merged with another company to become the mighty Bando Namkai that we all know today. Conversely, Monolith's CEO Hirohide Sugiura felt that after the merger, they were getting less and less flexibility to create what they wanted, so they broke away from Namco in search of better opportunities. They then struck up a relationship with Nintendo's Shinji Hatano, who promised more creative freedom in their games as long as they were exclusive to Nintendo hardware. After that, it wasn't long before they were tasked with making something very different and very quickly for Nintendo's then newest hardware, the Wii, or as it was known back then, the Revolution. Now, look, b before we go any further, I have to address the uh, fire tornado in the room. There's probably a sizable percentage of you out there that might not have even heard of today's game, and there's a good reason for that. So, if you are a disaster day of crisis virgin, then let's take a moment to catch you up. Raymond Bryce is a former U.S. Marine and International Rescue Team member who gets caught in the middle of a paramilitary force named Surge from occupying Blue Ridge City. They're demanding a ransom from the U.S. government, and if their demands are not met, then they'll unleash a man-made earthquake that'll set off a chain reaction of every disaster movie cliché you can think of. Along the way, Ray will save dozens of people, shoot dozens of people, and eat an entire watermelon in one go. As to how this crazy adventure came all about, well, I'll let the game's producer, Hitoshi Yamagami, set the stage. Approximately one year before the release of the Wii, around the beginning of 2006, my boss Sugiura said, let's do something big and epic for the release of the Wii. Up until then, Monolith Soft had worked mainly on RPGs, but is also very good at video production. So I decided to work on something that makes good use of that. As a result, the project turned into an American movie-like action game dealing with natural disasters. When this idea started to come together, I realized that it would be interesting. However, the content was so rich that I wondered if it could really be done in just nine months. But the team said that it could, so we started development. However, by the end, it turned out that the development itself was a disaster. So yeah, the only mandate from the higher-ups was to make something epic for Nintendo's new console, but they only had nine months in which to do so, as the Wii was releasing that November. While the studio's pedigree laid in RPGs, they had the foresight to realize something of that scale couldn't be done in such a time frame, so they decided an action game would be a safer bet. But just a simple shoot bang wouldn't be epic enough, so like Yamagami said, natural disasters were thrown in. You know, as a little treat. Problems started to happen almost immediately. Oh, this definitely has turned out to be one hell of a day. The main one being that Monolith Soft did not receive Wii development kits right away. They did have an idea of the final specs, but they had to start designing the game with their old GameCube kits. Now, this wasn't seen as a problem at first because they were pretty familiar with the old lunchbox as they were just finishing up Baton Kaidos Origins at the same time. 
So they simply plugged away like this for a few months, but when they did receive the final Wii hardware, they realized several aspects of the game just wouldn't work. They had designed this early version of Disaster with standard controls in mind, and thus classic controller support was what the game primarily used, having no idea just how integral the Wii Remote would be to the Wii experience. Amongst the team, it didn't take long for concerns to start arising that day of crisis, despite having some exciting ideas, wasn't all that thrilling or unique to actually play. Since a good chunk of the game revolved around saving people from perilous situations and tending to their wounds, but with that initial reliance on standard controls, all you had to do was press the A button and BAM, you were a hero. Many on the dev team felt that this wasn't particularly fun or inventive, and since it was a core concept of the game, these concerns were very valid. This got to such a point that in October of 2006, just a month before the Wii was scheduled to hit stores, that the team were still struggling, so it was decided by Yamagami and his bosses to shelve the game temporarily because there was no way it was going to make launch. This is actually a refreshing change of pace when compared to most stories we cover here at What Happened, because many games are simply visited by the good old captain in order to get them over that finish line, which as we know, rarely ever works in the short or the long run for that matter. This was, though, an especially tough time for the team, as their first big game under a new partnership with Nintendo was clearly not going well, and they would miss the lucrative launch period. It could have been worse, though, because Disaster narrowly avoided being cancelled altogether. Damn it! Yamagami recalls this pivotal point in the game's life cycle. I considered cancelling the development, but I thought that would be a waste because of the theme and the cinematic style presentation was very interesting. Although it would cost a lot of money, I thought it could result in a unique game, so I set a new timetable and discussed how to steadily solve the problems one by one. After a while, we had a proper development system in place. So, with a new plan and refocusing on the control possibilities of the Wii Remote, the team expanded the game in a lot of key ways. While you could navigate environments and rescue people like the original builds, combat would be handled completely differently, becoming an on-rail shooter whenever encounters with Surge broke out. One thing you can certainly say about the Wii Remote is that it made this type of gameplay immediately accessible, and what's more is that it wasn't some basic implementation of it either. With the new release date being shifted to 2008, it allowed Monolith to really flesh this out. You could acquire multiple weapons with different firing speeds, crit chances, and ammo capacities. You could even unlock crazier special weapons and level each gun as you play through the story, leading to a pretty robust system when compared to other light gun fare. Driving sections were also added, which saw Ray Ray and his chin strap either dodging cars, collapsing buildings, or even volcanic rocks being spewed into the sky because that's how disastrous this game gets in a single day. This man will be in danger if he stays with me. Now, since these vehicle bits used motion controls exclusively and was one of the last things they implemented, a few of the staff felt they were a bit too difficult, as just one or two mistakes could force the player to start over. Over. Having experienced them a few times myself, I uh, tend to politely agree. Now, the man orchestrating all of this disaster, Keiichi Ono, had up until then only directed in-game cutscenes for Xenosaga and Baden Kaitos, and found himself in the big chair for the first time. He was the one that came up with the idea of an action game revolving around a famous WWF tag team, and he also found the game's development a bit taxing to him personally. Monolith Soft has made many RPGs, so it was a challenging project in terms of general know-how. The procedure for making a game, how to put everything together, becomes RPG-like itself if you approach it a certain way. There was definitely a learning period to make that method suitable for action games, so that's where I struggled initially. In the end, I cleared each problem while learning how to make everything work. 
As the release date approached, the team was keen to include all the features the Wii could provide, and delivered something that was unlike any other game Nintendo had published yet on the console. It launched in September of 2008 in Japan and was published by Nintendo themselves, and while it shared a lot of similarities with the Disaster Report series, its focus on action, cinema-style presentation, and a strong main hero set it apart. That also reflected in the review scores that it garnered, which were all above average or even better for the most part. However, the crisis was not yet over for Raymond Bryce. In fact, his most perilous journey had barely even started. A tsunami. A big one's coming. While quick video snippets of disaster were seen in several Nintendo presentations and social media accounts throughout 2006 and started again in 2008, it began to no-show in a lot of Nintendo of America's release lists and PR, which led many to speculate that it might not make the trip across the pond. That's because just two years into the Wii's life, fans were starting to get used to the fact that not all games announced by Nintendo of Japan would see release outside of Japan. The first real hint that Disaster's chances of making it over were slim was with an IGN podcast where Matt Casamassina paraphrased a conversation he had with then NOA president Reggie fils we hung out with Reggie, and basically, he doesn't think Disaster is a $50 game, especially in terms of audio, which he said is laughable. He's going to wait to watch and see how it performs in Europe. If it does well, you'll probably get it in America, and if it's a bomb, you probably won't. This news, as you can imagine, made the rounds as websites love to point out the many games that Nintendo of America would skip. Of course, amplified by Project Rainwater, what was it, what was it called? Um, o Operation Rainfall. God, that takes me back. Now, talking brass tacks here, it's true that certain specific games made for the Japanese market might not appeal elsewhere, but like, Disaster Day of Crisis was literally modeled after American films, so it couldn't have been more appropriate. The prevailing theory is that much like the legendary Metal Wolf Chaos's original release in 2004, was that PR people would sometimes worry that American sensibilities and cliches captured through a Japanese lens still might not translate well. Like, wait, what are you talking about? I'll smash it faster than a Florida recount. Regardless, this is going to be a sticking point with disaster from here on out. The script and the voice acting. Tough guys like you were such fun. It'll be so much more satisfying when I destroy you. Now then, shall we dance? In a way, we're not down with it. I, honestly, it doesn't even matter the reason why. Just know that they weren't having it. I mean, personally, I can't imagine it any other way. They kidnapped her. Which is also a sentiment shared by the actual people behind the dub and the motion capture. <laughs> Most might know Ruben Langdon from This party's getting crazy. Let's rock. And This could be interesting. Bring it on, Meatball! But aside from just voice acting, Mr. Langdon has an extensive history working in Japan on Sentai action series, stunt work, and has done motion capture for major Hollywood films and about every AAA game series you can think of. The company he co-founded, Just Cause Productions, were then hired to bring that cinematic flair to the cutscenes that Monolith Soft were looking for. He expressed his disappointment regarding the lack of news for a North American release and even confirmed that the game's audio and script were a point of contention. Still not sure if we will ever see this game stateside. After we finished the mocap and voiceover stuff, Nintendo of America decided that the dialogue would not fly with American audiences. The original cast was brought in to re-record a lot of their lines. Probably the most noticeable change was changing Storm to Surge. 
A lot of the other changes were pretty minor, just changing sentence structure and other stupid stuff. Not quite sure why they did it, the original sounded fine to me. Last I heard, there were actually going to be two versions of the game. I think the Japanese release stuck with the original version, the one that we, Just Cause, created together with Monolith. Not sure about the European version, whether they went with the original or the Nintendo of America rewrite. Anyway, I do hope it does make it to the shelves, whichever version they decide to go with. Like I said, a lot of hard work went into making it. I just don't want it to go to waste, damn it! To clarify, the re-recorded dialogue was in the European and Australian versions, which released shortly after the game's Japanese debut. Furthermore, Reggie himself did confirm in an investor meeting that NOA was indeed going to be gauging the game's EU sales and then make a decision based on that. Don't tell me. Okay, it's it's a bit tricky to actually make a good guess of overall European numbers, as each country reports them all separately and inconsistently, so we're going to have to rely on the UK charts. Yeah, it's not great. During the entirety of Disaster's debut month, October 2008, well, it simply failed to crack the top 50, meaning it didn't even chart, so things were uh, fast becoming... Uh, yeah. Japanese numbers honestly weren't much better. It moved somewhere in the neighborhood of 21,000 copies before dropping off the charts there as well. As to why, well, you can certainly make the argument that action games like this weren't exactly what the Wii was all about, but it's also a fact that Nintendo of at any part of the world, marketed the game rather poorly. There were minimal print, TV, and online ads for it, which of course was certainly a factor as to why it didn't make any tidal waves at retail. If you're among the many that hasn't played it, what you'll find is a fantastically cheesy, charming adventure that constantly throws new stuff your way in terms of gameplay, all to the bombastic orchestral score by Yoshihiro Ike. Story-wise, it's a cross between Metal Gear Solid and the aforementioned Metal Wolf Chaos, just with a lot of American disaster movie tropes mixed in. Because every disaster is like a gift from God! It's certainly rough in a few areas, I, I can tell you that for free, with graphics being a bit worse than what you'd see from the higher-end Wii games of the day. Certain missions, as discussed before, do feel a bit unbalanced. Again, something that I speak from experience, since I own both versions of it. Fortunately though, while the game was far from a success, it didn't spell desert for Monolith Soft as a studio. In fact, they started doing better than ever. Nintendo bought a majority stake in the company in mid-2007, which then resulted in the eventual release of Xenoblade Chronicles for the Wii. Given the studio's sterling RPG pedigree, it was indeed a pretty big hit that in turn led to Nintendo entrusting Monolith and supporting them on other big franchises like Smash Brothers, Zelda, and Animal Crossing. So fortunately, not a sad end at all, just a tad disappointing. If Nintendo wanted to mitigate risks, Disaster could have seen a digital release on the Wii U or hell, even the Switch itself, as most of its motion-centric sections would have played just fine. Keiichi Ono, for his part, left Monolith in 2012, but he was still credited as a combat designer on Xenoblade Chronicles X when that was released a few years later. So while its sales were dismal and Nintendo may have been right to not bother bringing the game to North America... No, fuck, they were wrong. I mean, they brought out goddamn Devil's Third in North America and that, that's way worse. So yeah, I, I, I don't have a point here. Just uh, the next time you see Raymond Bryce in spirits mode, just remember to thank him for saving the world during the course of that fateful day. If you know of any other disaster, cataclysmic video game or movie developments, let me know in the comments below, flail your arms as you run towards my Twitter, or wade through the waters of the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become a big burly boss to nominate the subject of a future episode. See you next time and thanks for watching. I don't want it to end yet! You sick bastard!
and welcome to another episode of What Happened, the show that's not profiled the single Nintendo published game since... Oh shit, ever. Yes, well, that's not to say there aren't a few we can gab about, but Nintendo is a fairly secretive company, as are a lot of their rivals in the Japanese game industry. The fact is, typically, to get behind the scenes information on Nintendo titles, good, bad, or... Eh, you just might need to be related to an uncle who happens to work for them. That being said, Trey Allens, a big boss member of the Flophouse VIP Patreon has helped narrow the focus onto what's certainly a topic worthy of discussion, that being the last game released under the legendary partnership between Nintendo and Rare, 2002's Dinosaur Planet, 2002's Star Fox Adventures. Ah, rare, rare wear, one of the building blocks of many a childhood. Beetlejuice, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, WWF WrestleMania, Donkey Kong Country, Killer Instinct, Jet Force, Gemini, and on top of them all, grabbed by the ghoulies. <laughs> now, while there are several things worth talking about when it comes to those crazy Brits over their legendary 30 plus year career, Star Fox Adventures was the first game of the fruitful collaboration with Nintendo that signaled the end of, let's not mince words, a magical era in video gaming. Unfortunately for the talented artists, musicians, and programmers who worked on Star Fox Adventures, there are many factors, problems, snaggo boops, trouble teenies, and big old todger blockers that seem to hamper the game's development, with almost all of it outside of Rare's control. Our story should begin with just how Rare operated in the mid-90s, which saw all of their many small teams being sequestered into their own offices or barns, and left to do whatever they wanted, which included slapping googly eyes on just about everything, as there was a sort of friendly rivalry to outdo what each team was working on, with the elusive stampers presiding over it all. These super stamper brothers also did their best to mediate between Nintendo and the teams themselves, communicating Japan's thoughts on each project without having to bog down the teams with constant requests and tinkering. I, I can't understand you! One of the more successful of these projects at the time was Diddy Kong Racing, one of Rare's many fondly remembered classics. When the adventure slash kart racer was first revealed, it was then released only a scant few months later, giving Nintendo a big holiday title that they would have been otherwise without. Once work on Diddy was complete, the team split into two, with one rocketing away onto Jet Force Gemini, and the other moving on to a project called Dinosaur Planet. Former longtime producer at Rare, Lee Schumann, had a wealth of ideas, which he then began sketching, coming up with the concepts and characters to populate this glorious world of reptiles, with nary a single heathenistic feather to be seen. Even at this early stage, the game was going to be a 3D adventure on one large continuous world, would interweave dual stories led by two different heroes, Crystal and Saber. No, no, not that Saber. No, not that one either. Yeah, no, yeah, that that's that's the one. To save the eponymous dinosaur planet, which was under siege by the nefarious General Scales. Once they had settled on the theme, Rare had to go about you know, figuring out how to move characters in 3D platforming space, which, believe it or not, they were still grappling with at that time. The only games they'd released on the N64 by 1997 were Goldeneye, Killer Instinct, Blast Core, and DKR, as Banjo-Kazooie was still a year away from completion and was being made by a completely different team at Rare. So the young and very small group plugging away at Dinosaur Planet were coming to terms with full 3D worlds when a huge bit of inspiration came via Nintendo themselves, and that would be their tiny experimental project called Ocarina of Time. As you could imagine, this milestone in gaming caused the team at Rare to suddenly rethink what they thought they knew, which they were never even 100% sure about anyway. The then massive open world of Hyrule was the perfect template in which to base Dinosaur Planet on, and thus the project took on a slightly new identity, but helped the team focus and hone in on what they wanted the game to be. The next few years went by learning and studying from Ocarina, as well as the deluge of 
of 3D platformers that were being released, resulting in the team making obviously slow but steady progress. This was kind of Rare's MO, giving each project the time they needed to perfect things, while also simultaneously getting titles on store shelves. Because there were so many small groups working at the same time on vastly different games, a team would just start kicking off something new while another game was going through the final round of bug testing. It took all the way until 2000 for Rare to formally unveil Dinosaur Planet at that year's E3, and since it was so late into the N64, for his life cycle, it wowed a lot of people at the show from a technical standpoint. By this time, Rare knew the N64 like the back of their hand, especially since more members had joined the Dinosaur Planet team since, bringing the experience of having worked on Banjo, Jet Force, and the like. Now, during the spectacular first showing, Nintendo's own Shigeru Miyamoto took an interest in the game when he saw the anthropomorphic characters of Crystal and Saber. In an interview with Nintendo Life, Rare's lead software engineer on the project, Phil Tossel recalls this pretty pivotal turning point for the game. I don't know for sure where the idea originally came from, but I definitely heard it mentioned that Miyamoto-san had suggested it. Of course, we were slightly disappointed at having to change Dinosaur Planet as we had all become so attached to it, but we could also see the potential of using the Star Fox license. That's because both Crystal and Saber, a fox and a wolf, did bear resemblance to how the iconic animal army from Nintendo's flight games were being being depicted. With that suggestion, the project then transformed once more, and it wouldn't even be the last time. While Miyamoto has been known to give somewhat vague advice to other studios working under Nintendo, Samus should be able to put on other heads equals give her different vision modes? His suggestion was pretty cut and dry. In terms of marketing and familiarity, Dinosaur Planet would do better under the furry paw of the Star Fox license, which hadn't seen a new entry since early 1997. Now, while the team at Rare had put a ton of work into it already, with its world and characters fully fleshed out, it was still quite different than the final game. You could actually swap at any time between Crystal and Saber by speaking to Swap Stones. These survived the transition to Star Fox Adventures, but their use changed to being Warp Stones. Originally, Crystal also had a sidekick character called Kite, similar to Tricky in the final game but a pterodactyl that could fly. The story was also quite different. Even with the praise coming from E3 that Dinosaur Planet was an N64 stunner, it, like a lot of E3 titles Nintendo showed that year, all went through a re-evaluation, with a few of them, such as Eternal Darkness, being moved over to the forthcoming GameCube, which was only a year away from launch. Thus, with this new Star Fox edict, and with the R-Wing's destination locked in on the GameCube, the team was forced to scrap a lot of what had been done, find ways to incorporate Fox and crew, and suddenly be thrust into working on a vastly different machine than what they had been working on for the last three years. Despite now working directly on a beloved Nintendo IP, Phil Tossel found Nintendo's involvement on the project to be hands-off as usual, aside from one trip to Kyoto to speak to Nintendo's higher-ups, as well as having Takaya Imamura, one of the creative minds behind the Star Fox universe, visit the UK to oversee things. While the bulk of the game had been done, that didn't mean the transition was without its own fair share of hiccups. When we first conceived the idea of a no-loading world, it was on the N64, which of course had cartridges, making instant loading much more straightforward. However, by the time we moved to GameCube, we were faced with our first experience of a disc-based medium, which added complications. In addition, with the move to Star Fox branding, we had space levels, which we had never envisaged in the beginning. Also, keeping that misbehaving little dinosaur tricky in check was a lot of work. There was tons of setup involved to ensure that he always stayed with Fox and never got lost or trapped. God damn it, Tricky! Tricky! Ugh. While Rare was accustomed to taking all the time they need to polish games and make sure every dinosaur was in their place, Star Fox Adventures had the dubious distinction of being caught in something bigger than just wayward AI pathing. In September 2002, the same release month as Star Fox Adventures, Microsoft confirmed the worst kept secret in gaming at that time. They were buying Rare, which would then become 100% fully owned by the technology giant. 
Nintendo had sold their 49% stake in the company back to the Stamper Brothers, and the deal was struck. Now, even though this was only confirmed that month, multi-hundred million dollar deals like that just don't happen overnight, and had been in the planning phase for months. The Stampers were very open about the situation, at least as much as they could be. I think for me, it was a blessing to be working on Star Fox Adventures, because we still had a clear deadline for completion of the game, but we knew we had to get it done before any sale occurred. Other parts of the company struggled for focus around that time because of all the uncertainty. So from our perspective, it really just spurred us on to get Star Fox Adventures finished. That being said, because of the many different directions the game took, not unlike many Rare projects, Star Fox Adventures was a unique case in Rare's history, as so many orbiting elements impacted the game in one way or another, which may have resulted in some aspects of the game feeling somewhat padded, tacked on, or in the worst case, simply unfinished. While Rare had increasingly increased the number of collectibles in all their 3D platformers, Fox's quest had taken this to new, unseen levels of collectaholism. You know, you're gonna need to go to Collectahols Anonymous after spending five minutes with this thing. Also, the R-Wing sections, as nice looking as they were, felt devoid of any real substance, with their inclusion only being there because they needed to be there. And finally, the clumsy mishandling of the game's main villain, General Scales, who simply vanishes from the game, only to make way for one of the most shoehorned final bosses of all time. No spoilers here. But it's fucking Andross. I totally understand the reaction because many of us on the team felt the same way. Personally, I knew the game had its flaws. It borrowed a little too heavily from Zelda, I think. It also felt a little too much like the Star Fox elements were tacked on. Which, of course, they were. <laughs> yeah, no shit. The game changed so many times during development that it was impossible to keep track of what was added and removed. I think the only thing that we wanted to make more of was the R-Wing sections. These were added fairly late and because the game had not been designed with them in mind from the beginning, it stretched some of our tools beyond what they were really designed for, limiting the scope and refinement of them. So when Star Fox Adventures came out, it also had the added baggage of being the last rare game to be released under Nintendo. Uh, thanks Microsoft? Maybe you could have delayed that announcement like a, like a month later? Regardless, it unfairly found itself with this heavy burden weighing on its brittle furry shoulders. While some fans greatly appreciated Dinosaur Planet, its attractive visuals, characters, and seamless world, those aspects that felt tacked on, frustrating unpolished sections, and a story peppered eh, by strange pacing and plot holes left its reception feeling somewhat what lukewarm at best. And even with the subtitle of Adventure being added on, the game wasn't what everyone was expecting, especially hardcore Star Fox fans, as the more melee-focused encounters and hollow flight sections failed to inspire. Now, even with a tepid response, even long after the game's release, it would result in Nintendo and others taking several key elements introduced in Rare's take and running with them. Like, literally. While on-foot combat was sorta of touched on in the multiplayer Star Fox 64, it was Namco's Star Fox Assault which put a huge emphasis on ground-based skirmishes, with uh, similar polarizing results. Crystal was also fully brought into the fold, pack, clan, whatever, as the series always lacked a strong female presence, and has appeared in almost every single Star Fox game since. Strangely though, Tricky never saw a similar rise in popularity. See you later, guys. Unfortunately, since then, Nintendo hasn't quite nailed what Star Fox should be. Again. And again. And uh, again, it remains to be seen if they ever truly will. As for Rare themselves, well, after having just about every non-Connect game pitch get shot down by Microsoft for almost an entire console generation, Sea of Thieves, despite a rocky start, has grown to be a hit, and modern day Rare are currently working hard on the promising looking Everwild. But what about Phil Tossel? Well, he stayed with Rare until... The Dark Years, right about 
about here, and like many other staffers, decided the time was right to leave. Mission accomplished. He even formed his own company in 2014 and released the charming Tengami before shacking up with Platonic to work on ukulele, again like most rare employees. He reflects on his time at the company and working with Nintendo in the earlier days as the best time of his career. Without a doubt, of all the time I've worked in the industry, it was the most trusting and respectful relationship. Of course, it helped because technically Rare was independent. Nintendo only owned 49% of the company. This meant that the Stanford brothers didn't have to do anything they didn't want to. This contrasts sharply with how it is now, where Microsoft owns the whole company. In many ways, for me, Rare doesn't exist exist anymore. That is, the rare that I knew and loved, and that I got up every morning like an excited child to go work for. The rare where all my friends were, most of whom are no longer there. And so, that rare doesn't exist anymore. The rare that does exist is a new rare, an involved rare, with different goals and different aims, and I think and hope that they will go on and continue to thrive in their own way. And with that, if you know of any other tragically tearful tales of total travesty, let me know in the comments below or barrel roll your way over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate your own custom subject for us to analyze in agonizing detail. See you next time, and thanks for watching! Good luck! Hello and welcome to another episode of What Happened, the show where, hey, hey, remember last, remember last week when I said, the show that's not profiled a single Nintendo published game since, uh, oh shit, ever. It's almost like I've planned this stuff. One thing you can certainly say about Nintendo is that they usually have a very high bar of quality on a polished technical level. Yes, some aspects might be divisive, you'd wish some characters and franchises would get their time to shine again, but for the most part, what they make is usually solid. There's been only a few scant times in the past decade where collectively everyone can point their fingers at a Nintendo published game and say, yeah, that's, that's not very good. Devil's Third is certainly one of those times. Now, there's a lot to unpack with this story, but first let me be clear, Nintendo did not in any way develop this weird pastiche of a hack and slash and shooting. There was simply the company that wound up having to publish it because, woo, damn shit crappy crap, a whole lot of companies did not want to publish it. It took roughly eight years, I didn't stutter, eight years for Devil's Third to become a product you could buy with legal tender and, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a what happened right there. Big mistake. I agree. As to who developed this infamous bit of software, well, that would be Valhalla Game Studios, and more specifically, Tobinobu Idigaki, and more specifically than that, the Japanese Tommy Wiseau. Alright, set the clock back. Now, aside from the fact that I just said that, more importantly, why did I say it? Well, a lot of the information about Devil's Third comes from an interview, an interview between Idigaki and Polygon, and it's one of the most batshit insane pieces of text ever committed to digital paper you're ever going to read. He goes on and on and on about nothing most of the time, making weird ass analogies and outlandish claims about game sales, reviews, and life in general. It's a goddamn journey, I'll tell you that for free. So with that disclaimer out of the way, let's slice and dice into one of the worst reviewed, lowest selling games of 2015 that Nintendo was basically shamed into publishing. Itagaki was, of course, the infamous director, or general as he fancies himself, of Team Ninja, a group within Tecmo that always seemed to be as concerned with making 40 second long intros for themselves as they were about making games. In the early 2000s, they decided to shack up with Big Daddy Gates, delivering exclusive games on Microsoft's OG machine for a number of years. This lasted until Itagaki suddenly left Tecmo in 2008, citing creative differences, or he got bored, 
court or sexual harassment charges. Regardless, he decided to set up Valhalla most likely because he still wanted a cool long intro that showed stormy weather and took a number of producers and designers from Team Ninja along with him. Now, since he was on such good terms with Microsoft, they were the first logical burning oil drum in which he could warm his hands by. Microsoft even issued their own personal statement on the split between he and Tecmo. Tobinobu Itagaki has decided to leave Tecmo and Team Ninja to pursue other opportunities. We thank Tobinobu Itagaki for the many years he has supported the Xbox as he has contributed immensely to the success of the video game industry as a whole. Now, it's not every day a company who does not employ a particular person still makes a statement on that person's change in position. Imagine when yeah, Cliffy B had to announce his company was a huge failure and he had to close it. And then all of a sudden Nintendo was like, oh man, yeah, super rub, dude. Yo, wish you luck, no peace. So with that small gesture, it's easy to see why Microsoft would want to snap up Itagaki so he'd make them some cold, hard Japanese action games. Or or, or like some, some bouncy, soft, creepy Japanese voyeur games. The thing is though, when Valhalla was all set up and Itagaki was ready to talk turkey and ask Uncle Bill to open up his checkbook, something unexpected happened. Microsoft was out of fucks to give for any game that was unsuited to have a bright purple Kinect sticker on its box. Yeah, despite those heartfelt words from Microsoft, they actually turned down Itagaki's proposal, as Microsoft had switched to the controller-free revolution, which lasted like two years. So yes, they weren't really an option anymore. But you know who was desperately trying to pivot their entire business model in a last-ditch effort to avoid bankruptcy after their own similar what happened with the UDraw tablet? That's right, THQ, and boy, at that point they'd greenlight anything they could to get away from the stinky childlike stink of their previous 20 years of business, even if they couldn't afford to. This resulted in the tragic cancellation of things like a bunch of Finnish Saints Row games, Guillermo del Toro's Insane, and probably some other cool shit we don't even know about. Under THQ is when the game started to take shape, and even produced the first trailer, which in all honesty might have done a bit more harm than good in the long run. It was formally announced in the summer of 2010, and what we see here seems to be a stylish action game with multiple characters. Seems like it could be some type of multiplayer thing. Yeah, this seems like what an Itagaki would make. Speaking of which, he even managed to squeeze his own quote into the announcement as well. Who would have thought? In the past, I created four unique games, Dead or Alive, Ninja Gaiden, DOA Extreme, and Ninja Gaiden Dragon Sword. That's that's being really generous. Anyway, he then said, Thus, this announcement will be the fifth all-new project of my lifetime. My heart pounds with anticipation every time I make this announcement. It's not something I get used to. Complacency is never an option for me. Okay, calm ton tits, buddy. Let's see. Anyway, work continued on the game for a further two years, with absolutely no updates until May of 2012, where THQ announced that, yeah, things were going poorly. Apparently, an outside third party had been supplying the engine for the game, but was never explicitly named, and that company just went out of business for some reason. You might want to chalk this one up to an act of God, since it was out of Valhalla and THQ's control, but... Nah, it's actually just called bad business. THQ's Brian Farrell stated that the profitability of Devil's Third was not competitive with our other releases. And that's probably because, firstly, they'd have to find a new engine, which costs time and money, and secondly, the yen was gaining in value over the American dollar at that point, further decreasing the game's prospects. THQ's head of hardcore gaming, Danny Bilson, was a big fan of the project and saw the potential in it and worked behind the scenes to still try to make it happen. It was at this time when they decided for now to switch the whole game over to the Phoenix engine, no, not that Phoenix, which was a custom Havoc-based bit of tech and was also what the then upcoming Darksiders 2 ran on. Another year passed before THQ announced to the world who already knew that yes, their anus was bleeding and they have no way to plug it up, so please help them for God's sake. 
but no one really came to the rescue, and instead a multitude of publishers simply swooped in and picked the carcass of THQ clean, with Nordic Games leaving with the fullest belly. What the hell is this? The best of it's... Out of all those franchises that found a home though, Devil's Third was the odd game out, and instead of going to the warm, loving embrace of a new mama or papa, the rights to the franchise reverted back to Valhalla Game Studios, who could then do what they wanted with it. In the Polygon interview, Itagaki states that this was a difficult time, but Danny Bilson still had his back. How long was it when you signed with THQ until THQ closed as a company? I don't know, I'm a mathematician, but I'm no good at counting. But, what? but I worked with Danny until the very end, even after THQ closed. That's why he's at the very beginning of the staff credits of Devil's Third. Aww. So left with an unfinished game, engine, and no publisher, it was back to the races to find someone who could get this thing to market. Enter a company you've never heard of, Dubic Entertainment! Worldwide! They were a South Korean publisher who had experience with FPSs, and promised Itagaki they would get the game onto PCs and mobile platforms, for some reason, within the next fiscal year. But before all that, they had something to take care of, and that was going out of business. Ah, you can't make this up! This is why I love doing this show! Mm. Anyway, left with an unfinished game, engine, and no publisher, it was back to the races to get this thing to market. It is now 2014. Valhalla Game Studios is still somehow in business. I mean, I mean, business is a strong word because you actually need to produce a thing or provide some t type of service to be in business, ideally. But because, like, since their founding in 2008, they have released zero titles. Eight years, no games. How is that possible, you ask? Don't even ask. Okay, for real though, when you have no money coming in, like, at all, how do you keep a company with multiple employees afloat. Well, Polygon was curious about the same thing. So, how are you able to keep the company going through that period of time? That must be one of the seven wonders of the world. It's through determination and honesty to each other. As you can see in this picture of our team, we are all happy. All of us believe that we are going to make something great and a savior would always come along. This is a picture of us in China with my sensei, Leijie Matsumoto. We have big supporters in China, Russia, the US, Canada, and elsewhere who stepped up to help us. What does that mean, Itagaki? Do, do, do you have some side hustles going on? Are you importing jeans from Korea? Where's that paper coming from? Regardless, it was at that year's E3 where Nintendo made a surprise announcement in one of their Treehouse streams. Devil's Third was back. It had a new look, or like, I guess this was the first look at it, technically, and it was a Wii U exclusive. It was shocking, you know, may maybe not Bayonetta too shocking, but it did surprise the niche number of fans who even remembered what Devil's Third was. Itagaki recalls how this all went down. After THQ closed, Valhalla CEO Satoshi Kanematsu approached Satoru Iwata at Nintendo and they picked up the game. The reason why Nintendo picked up the game is that they don't have enough strong online titles. Devil's Third is not a game that Nintendo could make internally, so we came in as their mercenaries to make a strong online game. Okay, yeah, sure, dude. Anyway, fans were still taken aback at the game because it was quite different from the admittedly light-on-substance trailer that had been released years ago under THQ. That version of it seemed to employ maybe parkour and melee combat into a multiplayer setting or was never really stated. Whereas now, the game seemed to have been turned into a standard single-player action game like a lot of Team Ninja's previous efforts and featured a separate multiplayer component. The campaign was entirely focused on a Russian mercenary named Ivan, whose task was saving the world from falling satellite debris or, or something. To do so, he'll have to utilize either his clunky FPS shooting mechanics or his clunky melee mechanics to take down frustrating level after frustrating level. Oh, and there's bats too. Lots of... 
bats. While people were happy that the game had been resurrected, they were less happy at this change of gameplay style, and were even less happy than then at the idea of it being a Wii U exclusive, which was the style at the time. But it just so happened that Nintendo were the only ones willing to publish it. I, I mean, Nintendo of Japan were the only ones willing to publish it. So, we're coming upon the final hurdle in this sad journey of Devil's Third. Nintendo of America seemed to hate the game. This was a deal that was brokered by their counterparts in Japan, so when builds were sent to Nintendo HQ in Redmond, Washington, I can only imagine what they thought of it. It now ran on Unreal Engine 3. Not very well, mind you. It was glitchy, had awful textures, poor controls, input lag was just plain ugly, and by 2014 standards, was not all that exciting to play. Japanese action games, and hell, even Western third-person shooters had kind of pushed beyond what Itagaki had been making in 2008, so Devil's Third was now frantically trying to play catch-up. Already put in a difficult position by the previous company closures and engine changes, it was the one other facet that Valhalla failed to consider. Their piece of software had been trapped in this bubble of uh, unreleasing for almost a decade, with many trends, technology, and innovations completely passing them by. E3 2014 came and went without any further updates, and when Nintendo failed to mention the game at all during the following E3, people began to suspect something was up. Every asshole in this place knows I'm working for you. Might be a few minutes. It was then where a proverbial ping pong match between the media and Nintendo began. One side claimed one thing while the other deflected. The game was cancelled. No, it's not. You're not publishing it. We never said we were. So where is it? It's coming. When? I don't know. It came to a head when NOA simply stated that they were seeking out another publishing partner for Devil's Third in North America, because they would not be handling those duties. Problem with that is that Nintendo couldn't find anyone else to handle those duties. Duties. Why? Well, two reasons. A Wii U exclusive was a tough sell in 2015, so yeah, there's that. And two, those potential publishers probably played it. With no takers, Nintendo, knowing that the small but vocal fanbase still cared about Devil's Third, wouldn't let them live it down if they didn't release the game, especially since the Japanese and European branches had. So Nintendo basically just threw their hands and gave up. They relented, made it available as a download, and shipped physical copies. All 10,000 or less of them. And just like Nintendo predicted, the critical reception was similarly abysmal, with many review outlets citing it as one one of the worst games of the year, and considerably lowered Nintendo's own Metacritic score in the process. What did Itagaki think of all those harsh reviews? Well, the reviews for Devil's Third weren't stellar. The general view was that the game was stuck in the late Xbox 360 era. Let me try to explain this in parts. First, the reason the reviews were so poor. I have analyzed the reason. The game was designed to be a massive shooter, so it would be fun if there were at least a thousand players in the game, but Nintendo didn't set up online matches for reviewers, so there was no way for reviewers to experience the online mode as we designed it, and they reviewed the game based mostly on the single player story mode. If it had been Microsoft that had published the game, they would have given the game to a group of 500 players who had signed an NDA to play for the reviewers to experience the massive online mode, but NOA didn't do that. Which is, of course, a bunch of bullshit. In fact, the little praise Devil's Third did get was because of the in-depth multiplayer, which featured tons of characters, gear, maps, and modes. It was still a bit janky, but there was a lot of content. However, the game's campaign was so maligned, what with the poor optimization, voice acting, controls, graphics, levels, and general gameplay that reviewers were left with no choice but to score the game accordingly. Itagaki seems to have never addressed this, and instead focuses his criticisms elsewhere. They couldn't play the multiplayer, so there's no value to the review of someone who's evaluating a piece of art with blindfolds on. That was 95% of the negative criticism towards the game. No, it wasn't. The remaining 5% was by people who wanted to build credibility by criticizing the game. One person wrote a negative review, and NOA didn't do anything to stop or change that review, so others followed suit. So I don't really believe that the reviews were credible. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. 
Anyway, Nintendo pulled the plug on the game's servers less than a year later, which honestly was probably longer than it deserved. With that being said, the game's chunky multiplayer mode technically got another chance in the spotlight because it was cut out of the single player game and sold as a separate SKU on PCs in Japan, published by Nexon and dubbed Devil's Third Online, which, um, yeah, I don't think you can play and I'd be surprised if it still works. That all happened in 2016. Since then, what has Valhalla worked on? Nothing. Absolutely nothing, I think. It, it, it seems like another team with ties to them called Soleil might have made Naruto Shinobi strike or, or thing. I mean, I don't know. Yet, they are still operational, Valhalla. I, I guess out of all of Itagaki's friends across Russia, China, and Canada, they're still helping them? Speaking of Canada, there's, wait, there's also Valhalla Game Studio Vancouver, and it's actually now their headquarters? I, I can't, I can't anymore with that. I'm done. Tapping out. Ugh. While you think of any other mystifying misfires you'd like me to cover in the future, write them in the comments, check out the Patreon, and I'll leave you with one more parting word from our sunglass-wearing god of oatmeal cookies himself. When asked about the future of Valhalla and what platforms Itagaki is hoping to target for future releases, he calmly replied, I think that the future is stormy. It's difficult to see beyond that. See you next time, and thanks for watching! Hey, put your hands together if you want to clap as I take you through this game development rap. Oh, what happened? Oh, to Donkey Kong. What happened? The episode is here. All right, DK rap reference is out of the way, so now we can finally start the episode. Rare's Donkey Kong Country series needs no introduction, so let's just skip forward. What happened to Donkey Kong 64? Banana. It's 1996 and several of Rare's teams are finishing up their last few Super Nintendo projects, such as Ken Griffey Jr.'s winning run, the incomplete SNES port of Killer Instinct 2 that Tim Stamper refuses to release, and of course Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble. Several senior Donkey Kong Country leads had already moved on to Project Dream and eventually the N64, so Country 3's Banana Horde was left in the care of the remnants of the staff. Once that shipped in November of 96, the DK team then moved on to the fun machine themselves and started brainstorming ideas on how to bring the Banana Slamma's platforming legacy into the third dimension. While other rare teams were going ham on fully explorable 3D environments, Environments, the Donkey Kong team's first inclination was to keep things a bit simpler, opting for a 2.5D style perspective, which was a natural extension of the 2D DKC gameplay, despite, well, going against the grain of where platformers were headed in this new era of 3D graphics. Even though the 2.5D approach seemed like the easier plan of action, problems with this approach cropped up rather early, some of which were outlined by one of the chief designers, Mark Stevenson, in an interview with Nintendo Life, where he explained that after 18 months, the team decided to just scrap everything and start over from scratch for a variety of reasons. Now, I'm personally just fascinated by this early, still publicly unseen version of DK64, so I got into contact with Mark Stevenson, thanks so much to Daily Kong for the hookup, to see if he could share any additional insight, which he absolutely did. The original version of the game was more what you'd call a 2.5D platformer. Levels scrolled sideways rather than into the screen like Crash Bandicoot, but you weren't constrained to a fixed path like the country games. There was some depth to the pathways and you could move in and out of the screen a bit as well as moving left and right. I guess the original aim was to recreate the country games but with 3D graphics, but it was challenging in a few ways. Creating levels was incredibly time consuming and every bit of them had to be built and textured, whereas in the 2D games you could basically create a tile set for each level from the source rendered graphics and then you could pretty quickly build and adjust levels in an editor using the tiles. 
In 3D, the tools were pretty primitive at the time. The workflow was slow and the user experience was not great. So adhering to the country formula of levels you could play through once and then move on was looking to be a very inefficient way to proceed. So the project was rebooted, a designer was brought over from the Banjo team to lead it as they had experience of working on this type of approach. There was also a concern that in trying to recreate a DKC style experience, whilst we could match the gameplay, graphically with 3D where it was, we were never going to be able to make something so visually striking and groundbreaking as those games, so there was concern that it would not stand up well against the country games if we continued down that route. As Mark mentioned, that experienced Banjo staffer happened to be George Andreas, who put on the proverbial big red tie and became Donkey Kong 64's creative director. In a Games Radar piece for DK64's 20th anniversary, Andreas stated that the push into becoming a collectathon came straight from the very top. Banjo-Kazooie had a lot of great things about it, so one of the first things Tim Stamper, Rare's co-founder, told me was, make sure there's lots to collect. I'd always go back to him and say, here's some, and he'd go, no, more things. To facilitate those more things and to help DK64 stand apart from Banjo, it was decided that there needed to be a big shakeup within the Kong clan. The dual buddy format that Country had established in 1994 had already been pushed further by the bear and bird, so the thought process was that offering a whole squad of playable Kongs would help the game one-up Banjo and stand out from other 3D platformers, hopefully killing two zingers with one coconut. They weren't to know at the time, but this choice would lead to some uh, unexpected consequences. In the same Games Radar interview, Andreas explained how the playable roster ballooning up to five characters seemed like an easy and practical way to get the project on track. It added another layer of richness to the discoverability of each new character and gives them both a share of the spotlight and puzzle-solving aspect that feels quite fresh. The expectation was that once you enter a new area, you'd traverse it with one character and see a different puzzle element. You'd think, oh, what would happen if Chunky Kong was here? And it allowed the player to predict what puzzles they'd have to face with different characters and, in theory, keep the game fresh. Now, some fans have surely wondered over the years, if they wanted more characters, why add three new poochies? Why not just Dixie and, and Kitty Kong? Thankfully, Mark had answers for me. I guess we'd kind of set a precedent with the DKC titles where we would retain one character from the previous game and introduce a new one. So we knew we wanted to have Donkey and Diddy in the game, so it just felt like we should do some new Kongs to add some freshness to the roster and new personalities. Tiny and Chunky definitely shared some functionality similarities to Dixie and Kitty, so maybe we could have stuck with those, but I think Kitty Kong turned out to be quite a divisive character design and split people, so it definitely made some sense to drop him. Kitty Kong? D divisive? Uh, wait, wh what do you mean? <laughs> All right. The core concept of upping the roster was a fun one, with each Kong having their own moves and abilities that let them explore levels in different ways or access certain areas the other Kongs couldn't. So what went wrong with this whole idea? Collectibles, specifically the dreaded color-coded bananas. Each Kong can only collect one specific color of the delicious fruit, literally quintupling the amount of time players could spend in each environment if they wanted to collect absolutely absolutely everything. I'm sure whenever the team implemented a new collectible, they probably had a moment where they stopped and thought to themselves, is this, is this too much? Before imagining a giant googly-eyed Tim Stamperhead bellowing, no, more things. To finish up on this topic of collect goodies I'm sure those of you who are not familiar with DK64 might be going, ah, what is there, like 500 collectibles or something? That's not so bad when compared to modern- You're wrong! There are over 3,800 unique things to grab and covet in Donkey Kong 64, with close to 2,000 of those being required to beat the game, which even to this day is a world record. So with all that said, why don't we just move on?
David Wise, whose work on the DKC series includes some of the best music ever made, did not return for DK64. Thus, Grant Kirkhope was brought in to give the Kongs their own distinctive sound. This is also the portion of the video where I should start talking directly about the DK rap, although there's really not that much to tell. Many titles from Rare's catalog contain funny musical interludes or references throughout. So, according to Games Radar, what started as an innocent joke between Kirkhope, Andreas, and programmer Chris Sutherland turned into something else altogether. Grant's intention was more about making a silly simian intro, not to make the most bomb-ass rap joint ever made. I thought everyone would get the joke, but no one did. It was the first time I'd ever had anyone write something negative about my music. I've been fortunate up until then. People liked my tunes most of the time and it was supposed to be a joke track about monkeys rapping about bananas and grapes, so I felt a little bit hard done to. Yes, you're hearing that right. At launch, and for a number of years afterwards, the DK rap was widely mocked by fans slash critics. While people liked the soundtrack overall, the opening ceremonies were usually skipped. Once the game kicks into action and there's no Donkey Kong rap involved, however, the listening experience is mostly enjoyable. Gosh. Of course, with time and the Smash Brothers Melee remix keeping it in our collective consciousness, fans would come around to the sick beat and ludicrous rhymes that Grant had laid down, which he is forever thankful for. I'm glad I wrote it. It's been a fun thing to have people take the mickey out of me for years, and you know, my 17-year-old son and all his mates know it. None of those guys were born when I did that, and it's incredible that they now know every word. It's so nice to be popular. With all the pieces in play, the team plugged away on expanding the game with as many things as possible, even bigger and more open levels than banjo, a different musical instrument for every Kong, a widescreen mode, two unlockable arcade ROMs, 3D versions of a DKC staple, Welcome to bonus stage, and even split-screen multiplayer deathmatch, which heavily featured the Kong's new signature weapons. As some of you may know, however, arming the Kongs was a choice that Rare staffers, for a few sweaty seconds at least, got very nervous about. The story goes that Shigeru Miyamoto flew over to Rare's headquarters to check out an in-development build, with George Andreas on the controls, jumping and or bopping through the levels with everyone laughing and smiling. The vibe in the room then took a sudden and dramatic shift when Donkey Kong whipped out a realistically rendered metal firearm and just started blasting. It's at this precise moment that George realized that guns weren't a feature that had been initially run by Nintendo, which isn't surprising as they were mostly leaving Rare to their own devices by this point in time. Miyamoto apparently looked horrified at first, but then just as quickly took out a piece of paper and sketched a wooden bazooka with leaves sprouting from it, grinning as he passed the sketch over to George, who recalled, I looked at it and said, oh yeah, th that's cool, we'll put that in, and the coconut gun was put in after that. Despite the team's apparent ability to put so much into DK64, there are inevitably things that needed to be taken out. I asked Mark Stevenson if there were compromises they had to make to meet that all-important Christmas 1999 release date. I think every game you work on, there is always stuff that gets left out as ambitions are always high. I think more minecart levels would have been something everyone would have liked, but those levels took so long to build so it just wasn't feasible in the time frame. Also bosses. There were supposed to be more of those, which is why you see Armadillo and Dogadon twice. Those boss battles were literally cut in half so we could get enough boss fights in. There was one other big issue the team had to contend with, which turned out to be the... Uh, or rather, one of the things that Donkey Kong's 64-bit platforming debut is most infamous for. A rumor about a catastrophic bug and the costly last-minute solution to fix it. All of which, ultimately, might not even be true. You don't believe me? Well, feast your eyes on this! 
Okay, so the N64. The N64 expansion pack is a little red wonder that doubled the size of the onboard RAM the N64 could use from four to a whopping eight MB, which for most of the games that utilized it unlocked higher resolution visual modes. A handful of games locked content and game modes behind the expansion pack, and a few even required it to play at all. In Donkey Kong 64's case, according to Rare programmer Chris Marlowe, the expansion pack actually solved a crash issue that was detected at the 11th hour. As the story goes, there apparently was not enough time to fix it in the code itself, but plugging in the expansion pack seemed to do the trick, so Nintendo was forced to bundle an expansion pack into every copy of Donkey Kong 64, making for one of the most expensive bug fixes of all time. Derek from Subskeletons from Fighting. Yeah, hey, I'm Derek, it's me, Derek. Turns out that's not entirely true. What? In 2013, Chris Marlowe did state that the expansion pack was used to fix the crash bug, but in that Nintendo Life interview, Mark Stevenson clarified that this was not 100% accurate. There was indeed a bug where the game would crash due to a memory leak from built up garbage data, but the expansion pack was not the solution to the problem. What are you talking about, Matt? That's I, I know, actually, I, yeah, I know. He stated, this one's a myth. The decision to use the expansion pack happened a long time before the game shipped. In fact, we were called in by management and told we were going to use the expansion pack and that we needed to find ways to do stuff in the game that justified its use and made it a selling point. I think the bug story somehow got amalgamated into the expansion pack use and became urban myth. There was a game-breaking bug right at the end of development that we were struggling with, but the expansion pack wasn't introduced to deal with this and wasn't the solution to the problem. My memory is that, like all consoles, the hardware is constantly revised over its lifetime to take advantage of ongoing improvements in technology and manufacture methods to essentially make the manufacturer more cost-effective and eventually profitable. I think there were something like three different revisions of the internal hardware by this point, and the bug was unique to only one of these versions. We did eventually find it and fix it, but very late in the day. Which to me makes the most sense. Why would Nintendo spend more money than needed bundling an extra peripheral inside a game box just to fix a single bug? Ah, uh, okay. That totally lines up with something that's always kind of bothered me about this story. Something I touched on in this uh, little video over here. That Nintendo made the announcement that DK64 was going to need the expansion pack in May of 1999, only six months before the game launched. Like, you can't suddenly change mass production plans like throwing in a peripheral when cart manufacturing needed to start, especially for Nintendo's big holiday game. You need tons of lead up time for that. And this would explain why there's never been footage of DK64 running without the expansion pack. If it was just a bug fix, I mean, theoretically, you could hack around the expansion pack check, right? This is true. But since there was no bug, it must have beefed up the visuals or the frame rate or something. Did we ever find out what the hell this thing actually does? Well, on the Facebook group Rare Fans Treehouse, that very same question was posed by a fan and then answered by engineer Simon Craddock, who is credited on Donkey Kong 64. Oh my god, yes, what did he say? <laughs> He said, I should know, I was one of the four engineers on this project. The extra RAM is for the vertex lighting. Oh, oh, uh, well, DK64 does have some really impressive lighting. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> uh, oh, okay, the expansion pack mystery is solved now, so, so you can go now, Derek. All right, cool, bye. Uncle Derek blasting off again. Donkey Kong 64 launched in November of 1999 to a gorilla-sized amount of hype, with Nintendo apparently spending over $20 million on marketing alone, which was an insane number in the late 90s. This money, as it turns out, was well spent, as the DK crew would eventually sell over 5.2 million collectibles and units, making it Rare's third highest selling game of all time, coming in a few million short of both GoldenEye and the original Donkey Kong Country's worldwide totals. Reviews were also quite positive overall, but there was a notable criticism from some players that the game was more than just big, it was positively bloated. 
While the volume of collectibles certainly extended replay value, it did make the game feel like more of a grind after the opening hours. Going by HowLongToBeat.com, it took the average gamer as long to beat DK64 as it took them to finish both Banjo-Kazooie games, despite only having as many levels as a single Banjo title. Others took issue with the fact that DKC's fast-moving Twitch platforming gameplay had been supplanted by a slower, more exploratory one that wasn't as tight as Country or as novel and as fresh as Banjo or Mario 64. And of course, nobody got the joke that was the DK rap. Over the years, DK64 then built up an even worse reputation than it had on release, with many hypothesizing that the game's core issues led to a sort of death of the collectathon and the downturn in mascot platformers in general, although that's certainly a much more nuanced issue overall. I think if you look back, there were still plenty of mascot platformers which were coming out well into the sixth generation of consoles. Uh, were they as prevalent as they were in the 90s? No, maybe not, but it's quite a stretch to say DK64 suddenly killed the genre. In terms of the game itself, George Andreas certainly felt that there were some areas which could have done with a bit of spit shine. There's a lot I would do differently. We would scale things down, make things look sharp and focus on fewer things. I would have unified the banana system. That would have made it much easier for players to play through. I'd also promote more swapping between characters at regular intervals, but just having a consistent banana count rather than multiple colors would have improved things. On the flip side, there's also a subset of fans who have come to the game's defense, citing it as an example of 90s maximalist game design at its most over the top, giving the player so many things to do and challenges to complete that you, you just can't help but admire its ambition. This has resulted in two very different schools of thought regarding the game, with neither being 100% right or wrong about it, as it is a rather subjective thing. Regardless, DK64's legacy did not result in the death of the franchise, but I think we can all agree, since it's been eight years since the initial release of Tropical Freeze, it would be nice to finally see the Kong Clan perform for us one more time. Big thanks goes out to Mark Stevenson, Daily Kong, and good old Grunkle Derek for making this episode possible. And if you'd like to see me struggle to collect blueprints, banana coins, golden bananas, banana fairies, colored bananas, keys, crowns, medals, musical instruments, potions, etc., head on over to my gameplay channel Flophouse Plays to check out this video for all that monkey madness. And if you know of any other games or movies dripping with the dramatic banana juices, do let me know in the comments below or over on my Twitter, and hopefully I can unpeel those for you on our next episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching! Welcome back to another indigo hued episode of What Happened, the show that deep dives into games, movies, and consoles that absolutely went through it. And out of the many pieces of hardware that Nintendo has released over the decades, their plucky lunchbox shaped machine is certainly one such console. We'll look back upon much more fondly nowadays, Nintendo's sixth generation contender had been seen by many as a bit of a joke at the time for a variety of reasons and no amount of celebrities awkwardly holding the machine was going to change that. So, grab the nearest handle, you know, whatever's at arm's reach, and turn your wave birds to channel 3 or, uh, 4? Wait a minute. Okay, there. As I answer the question, what happened to the Nintendo GameCube? It's a pretty well-known fact, but the Big N gave up a lot of market share a lot of quickly during its battle with the original PlayStation. Sony's machine beat the N64 to market by almost two years, and was able to move a staggering 102 million consoles through the late 90s and early 2000s, via its contemporary marketing campaigns, a perfect read on the future being disc-based, which led to massive third-party support and, you know, just being being the cool new kid on the block. Meanwhile, the Nintendo Ultra 64 
put a lot of emphasis on multiplayer fun via its native four-player support and a smaller, but nonetheless still stellar, selection of exclusives developed mainly by Rare and Nintendo's own internal teams. Despite providing radically different gameplay experiences from what was available on the SNES and laying the groundwork for so many 3D gameplay conventions, the N64 sold a good deal less than its 16-bit predecessor, 32.9 million consoles against 49.1. Now, the Game Boy line was doing incredibly well, but still, Nintendo's piece of the overall video game pie was getting smaller and smaller, so they were well aware they were going to have to seriously address their missteps if they wanted to keep, you know, existing in the home console space. By far, the biggest of these missteps was their continued commitment to cartridges. Aside from certain technical advantages like faster data read speeds and more durability compared to the oh-so-scratchable 90s-era CD, the lower storage capacity and the high manufacturing costs of cartridges unfortunately ostracized Nintendo from third-party support in an era where developers were itching to implement CD-quality soundtracks, tons of voice acting, and elaborate CGI cutscenes. And of course, cheesy FMVs that I still love. To put it all in perspective on just how bad this problem became, the N64's other main competitor, the Sega Saturn, which despite selling far worse, had seen over 1,000 games ship worldwide, which more than doubled the N64's back catalog, which sits at just under 400. Up now, if I could again pull up the PS1 sales figures. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, you, you get the picture. So, when Nintendo began designing their next machine, carts were gone from, from like second one, but of course this big decision had to be done in the most Nintendo way possible. Instead of going with a standard or expected format, they went with their own proprietary mini-discs, which offered more space than traditional CD-ROMs, but still lagged behind the storage capacity of the forthcoming DVD by what most tech journalists and industry vets described as a huge shitload. GameCube game discs could hold roughly 1.4 gigs, while the DVD could easily house a girthy 4.7, with later DVD types taking on even heavier loads. I, I mean, you know, you do the math. Why did Nintendo do this? Well, they reportedly didn't have a whole lot of faith in the DVD format as a whole, just like they did for CD-ROMs the previous generation, didn't want to pay the licensing fees for the technology, and, most importantly of all, they were terrified of the piracy that had been rampant in the CD space. Even though this decision would generate a lot of long-term negative effects elsewhere down the line, it can't be denied that proprietary discs were indeed a good solution to all those pesky piracy problems. To make all of this happen though, Nintendo naturally needed to seek outside help, so the optical drive was designed by Panasonic, as Nintendo R&D had very little experience in this field. After a failed chipset venture with Samsung, Nintendo then partnered with up-and-coming graphics company ArtX, who were made up of former designers from Silicon Graphics, who had worked closely with Nintendo on the who would then begin working on their new Flipper chipset to power Nintendo's new machine. Flipper provided the backbone of the console's graphical capabilities, and even led to the Dolphin codename the GameCube went by for a few years. Nintendo felt this new chipset would give them the edge they needed, as Flipper was more powerful and versatile than the competition, and cheap to produce to boot. Nintendo engineers knew it was superior to what was in the Dreamcast, and they were confident it would easily outclass whatever Sony could throw at them next. Kenichiro Ashida led the hardware design for the GameCube, and he and his team worked tirelessly to deliver a form factor that was visually friendly and particularly compact, inspired largely by the small size of the GameCube discs themselves. The masterstroke of the design, however, was of course, the handle. 
During the team's research process, they found that a lot of 1990s era gamers regularly move their consoles around to find their ideal play positions, given that most controllers were still wired at the time. Ashida also regarded the handle as an overall aesthetic plus, helping to lend the console an even more friendly appearance. Miyamoto and his team, meanwhile, spent a long time in secret developing the GameCube's controller, abandoning many ambitious prototypes and other wild ideas until they honed in on something that was both comfortable and functional, while still having those oh-so-distinct Nintendo eccentricities. While things were starting to come together, Nintendo grabbed Martin Hollis, the director of GoldenEye, who at that time had just quit from his position at Rare and was in the middle of a vacation. Nintendo quickly sold him on an advisory job at Nintendo Technology Development, where he worked for about six months, helping and advising Nintendo's designers, marketers, engineers, and even Miyamoto himself on the console, its features, architecture, you know, the whole nine yards. Hollis would eventually suggest the name Star Cube, which Nintendo would actually go on to copyright as a potential name, although it obviously got tweaked in the end. In an interview on Video Games Chronicle, Hollis humbly admits that he doesn't know for sure if his initial suggestion led to the word cube being used, or if someone else within the company had come up with it on their own. In that same article, Hollis also explained how the overall design and look of the GameCube came to be, and how Nintendo was looking to position it. The size and the price go together, pretty much. As you optimize on cost, you optimize on the space as well. That was Nintendo's concept from the start. They had this idea that they wanted a small machine. Although they weren't explicit about this in public, they didn't want to compete on performance or be seen using numbers like polygons in a kind of marketing battle. The GameCube's design was complete by early 2000, with the initial plan actually to release it during the holiday season of that year to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the PS2 and prevent Sony from taking advantage of another year-long head start that they had with the original PlayStation. Obviously, that did not happen, due to that really pesky problem of games not even being close to finished. The second man in charge of Nintendo at that time, Hiroshi Imanishi, even kind of threw the software teams under the bus a bit in an old article on ZDNet. We are targeting a December launch before the Japanese Christmas season, but we have to take many things into consideration for political and strategic reasons, so we just cannot tell if the Japanese launch is 100% sure or not. It's always the case with Nintendo, the hardware is already completed, but the software is not. Eventually, Nintendo relented, choosing to delay the console's launch all the way to September of 2001 in Japan, November of 2001 in North America, and March of 2002 for Europe, for the very competitive price of 199 US dollars, a hundred dollars less than the competition. Regardless, Sony was still getting that head start completely unopposed, at, sorry Dreamcast, an advantage that Miyamoto tried to wave off by claiming that the GameCube software would be so irresistible and superior that it will become the requisite for everyone, even though they already have the PS2. This was a fancy way of saying that even if people shelled out $299 for Sony's machine, eventually they would all have to buy the GameCube. It was just a matter of time, no it wasn't. A lot of noise was made about the GameCube's default color scheme, which, even well into its life cycle and having seen a good number of other color options, was a critique it could never really shake. Before launch, Nintendo of America's marketing team were called in to give their input on what would ship to store shelves, input which would largely be ignored. Revisiting that same VGC article from earlier, Nintendo's former VP of Marketing, Perrin Kaplan, stated, We were called in to rate which colors we liked. There must have been 30 GameCube box samples in there, and the colors range from poopy brown to crazy and striking prime colors. I remember some were these dark yellow, almost skin tone-like colors, and we were like, You cannot launch that. It's so unattractive. Japanese leadership were pretty insistent on purple, or more accurately, indigo, as the default color, but Nintendo of America thought otherwise. 
we actually suggested that the purple was not the best to start with, and Japan said, no, we're going to use that. Then we pushed for black and silver, because I think in the US, nobody had ever really done the purple color before. It wasn't that you couldn't bring out hardware that was a different color, it was just a very female looking color. It just didn't feel masculine, I think. I remember us being very nervous at E3 that we were going to get bad press purely based on the color. Which they did! While it seems silly nowadays as expressing oneself via customization and multiple options is like a really reasonable thing, but the early 2000s were uh, a pretty different time. Anyway, after appearing at both the 2001 E3 and Space World shows, the GameCube released in Japan on September 14, 2001, with approximately 500,000 consoles shipped to stores. Around that same time, Nintendo of America were originally scheduled to hold an early star-studded pre-launch event, but uh, they obviously decided to delay that a little bit until October, cause yeah, I think the vibe would have been a little off if these now legendary photos have been taken immediately under the shadow of 9-11. The November 18th North American launch of the GameCube went relatively well, but it can't be denied that it lacked the killer app that Nintendo's previous consoles had all enjoyed. Absolutely no disrespect to it, but Luigi vacuuming up a storm in a haunted mansion didn't quite have the same impact as his brother swinging Bowser around in 3D for the very first time. Fortunately, Luigi wasn't alone, as he was also backed up by Ryoto Hayami and Luke Skywalker. Wave Race Blue Storm's gorgeous water effects and Rogue Leader's stunning dub everything made for an incredibly solid exclusive trio, with Miyamoto's charming Pikmin hitting store shelves less than a month later. All four were financial successes, but if you craned your neck just a bit to the side, you'd be able to see Final Fantasy X in its natural habitat, as it absolutely crushed everything at retail that same month. <laughs> Miyamoto's wild theory about PS2 users jumping aboard GameCube looked all the wilder as the days passed. As far as other key titles went, new Mario, Zelda, and Metroid titles were still about a year away, and their absence absolutely hurt the Cube's very important first holiday season and first year on the market. Thankfully, there was one little understated release which sprang up about a month after launch to help the GameCube ship weather these early rough waters. Melee would wind up being arguably the GameCube's most important game, selling over 600,000 units across its first few weeks in Japan and North America combined, and continuing to sell well and consistently over the course of the console's entire life cycle, clearing 7 million units until the Cube was eventually retired. While it remains the console's most successful title financially, smashing and or wave dashing didn't pry away the millions and millions more who were all glued to their PS2s or Xboxes. In fact, no matter the game, price drop, or marketing tactic, that was something Nintendo would never be able to do. That demographic, the fabled HARDCORE GAMER, was the main group the GameCube regularly tried targeting and failed to attract, even when Nintendo made a lot of big money moves to try to do just that. I went pretty in-depth on this in my Resident Evil 4 video, but Nintendo snagging RE exclusivity for a number of years was an incredibly lucky break, and while it produced some great games, Capcom shareholders were disappointed at the lackluster sales in comparison to the earlier PlayStation entries. This concern bled over into the once GameCube exclusive Capcom 5, or 4, which all got PS2 ports, sometimes with extra content, except for my beloved PN03, of course. Eternal Darkness, a psychological survival horror gem that Nintendo funded and published, despite its very strong critical reception, failed to sell even half a million copies, at least according to a claim by Eurogamer. Then, when Nintendo announced they had secured an exclusive remake of Metal Gear Solid, there was much rejoicing from the GameCube faithful, uh, before the Twin Snakes would reportedly post some of the lowest sales figures of the entire franchise. <laughs> 
I tried and failed to find concrete numbers for North America and Europe, but in Japan, it shifted only 71,000 copies in total. According to NPD group numbers archived in various places, Twin Snakes sold over 148,000 units in its first two months on sale in North America, while in Japan, it shifted only 71,000 copies across its entire life. Ugh. So it's very possible that it never even broke 300k, a depressingly low bar for a series as revered as Metal Gear. Mature rated and third party content rarely, if ever, sold blockbuster numbers on the GameCube, something that IDOS CEO Mike McGarvey pointed out when his company announced they were abandoning support for the Cube as early as 2003. The GameCube is a declining business. If other companies follow us, Nintendo will have a hard battle to fight. Y can you imagine how bad things must be going when third parties start recommending that other other third parties stop supporting you. After that, IDOS only shipped three titles on the GameCube by development teams who already had them in the pipeline, while PS2 and Xbox saw over 20 IDOS published games released within that same time period. The slumping sales numbers were publicly waved away by Nintendo higher-ups, though in a rare bit of transparency, Nintendo President Hiroshi Yamauchi went so far as to theorize that the massive disparity between the Cube and its competition was due to the popularity of violent games on other consoles, implicitly acknowledging that titles like Grand Theft Auto were far and away the biggest success story of the sixth generation. There were some extremely vague rumors that Rockstar had been planning to bring GTA to the GameCube in some form, but those seemed to be pretty unsubstantiated. Aside from their lone Cube title, Smuggler's Run, war zones, the GameCube evidently failed to riz up Rockstar, as the kids would say. The same story played out for a number of other publishers and franchises, where both the Xbox or PS2 saw some fairly big releases that just skipped the cube altogether. The Suffering, Blood Rain 2, PsyOps, The Punisher, Max Payne, Silent Hill, Castlevania, Contra, King of Fighters, Onimusha, Fatal Frame, the list goes on and on. While it's true Nintendo burned a few bridges during the life of the N64, the relationship with third parties was at an all-time low, being only perhaps by the woeful final years of the Wii U. Nintendo's play for the core audience had completely whiffed, and everyone knew it. The lunchbox's troubles came to a head when, at the start of 2003, Nintendo actually had to halt the console's entire production line to save money from overstocking warehouses with unsold machines. For around nine months, no new cubes were manufactured, the polar opposite of what you usually see from major hardware launches. Once production picked back up again in September, Nintendo smartly dropped the price of the cube down to $99, the same MSRP as the Game Boy Advance. I ain't gonna front though, that's a pretty fire deal. This coincided with the 2003 holiday shopping season, which did provide a nice boost in sales, but it wasn't momentum that was retained. Now, while it's been a good bit of gloom and doom up to this point, keep in mind, for the majority of the console's life, it was actually profitable for Nintendo. This was due to their aggressive cost-saving measures, which we've already touched on. No DVD drive, proprietary discs, and the inexpensive custom flipper chipset. Regardless of the bump, the PS2 would still firmly remain the market leader, and realistically, there was no way Nintendo would ever Ever catch up. The GameCube's design and Nintendo's philosophy behind it was locked in, mostly due to Hiroshi Yamauchi's extremely strict management style. Nowadays, if Nintendo of America pushed back against something, there's a decent chance plans could change, but not during the iron reign of Yamauchi. While he stepped down from his position as Nintendo president six months into the GameCube's life, it was too late to pivot from the course. Launch was a bust, all of Nintendo's internal teams were already committed to their projects, and only so much course correction could realistically be done by the new president, the late great Satoru Iwata. 
During all of this, the Game Boy Advance was the one big bright spot for Nintendo, selling over 81 million units throughout its life, where it operated with next to no competition. It was a huge success that Nintendo hoped to capitalize on in a few different ways with the GameCube. GBA to Cube connectivity was touted as the main selling point for releases like Four Swords Adventures, Animal Crossing, and Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles, along with full compatibility with the entire Game Boy lineage via the Game Boy Player. These were uh, fairly novel features, but if the goal was to get new butts and seats, they maybe weren't as flashy or as sexy as Nintendo thought they were. Simply put, the GameCube lacked the X factor it desperately needed to break out and appeal to the non or lapsed Nintendo fan. Yeah, you could easily carry the console around, but unlike the PS2 or Xbox, which allowed DVD and CD playback and online multiplayer, something the GameCube completely lacked. Dude! Dude. Uh, uh, almost completely lacked. Functionality and feature-wise, the Cube didn't offer much more than the N64 did, uh, unless you were a massive Game Boy Chad who demanded their handheld experiences must be on console. It was admirable that Nintendo stuck to their guns by delivering a pure, dedicated video game system, but technology and trends were rapidly changing around this time, and the bets they placed on the Cube's features were obviously not panning out. Even big innovations like the ever-wonderful Wavebird controller were somewhat muted as it wasn't there at launch or was made the standard for the console as the pack-in. If it had, Nintendo might have been able to levy it as even the slightest edge over the competition, although that still probably wouldn't have moved the needle all that much. This was a sentiment shared by Martin Hollis, who, if you recall, helped Nintendo with the Cube's overall design. In order for a console to win, you need to do everything right and then you need to have one more thing, a killer feature that nobody else has. Nintendo had suffered quite a punishing defeat with the N64. They made nice money, but they lost the majority market share. And the reason was because they didn't have a CD drive. Really, it's as simple as that. So that's something they got right on GameCube and it was also a lovely machine to develop for. But that wasn't enough. It didn't have that one more thing. It didn't have a gimmick, a secret weapon, or that one sizable feature that nobody else had. The handle and the idea of carrying it from house to house I think could have been great, but we just couldn't think of a way to make that a big deal. I never really felt like we made a success out of the handle. It was just nice to have, and that's it. As we are winding down, I will take a minute to talk about one aspect of the GameCube that Nintendo had apparently poured a bunch of money into that, unfortunately, never even released. An official 3D LCD screen add-on. Yes, more than a decade before the 3DS would hit shelves, Nintendo was fist deep into making their cubic console even more three-dimensional. For many years, this information has mostly been forgotten, but recent developments have brought some new info to light. In an Iwata Asks article on the subject of the Nintendo 3DS, Iwata shared that the GameCube actually has the necessary hardware to display 3D images, even sharing that they had a version of Luigi's Mansion that played out in full 3D directly on the GameCube hardware, and that the LCD screen that they had showed off at E3 2002 actually secretly supported this feature. Wait, Nintendo showed this thing off? Yes, although E3 2002 was just before everything went digital, so video or images of the device are extremely rare. Iwata also revealed that Miyamoto and future criminal Yuji Naka collaborated on a version of Fantasy Star Online 3 that allowed for two GameCubes to be hooked up, and using the LCD screen attachment would allow users to enjoy card battles without being able to see each other's hands. 
ultimately what sealed the add-on's fate was of course the price, as Nintendo never found a way to make it affordable, which was kind of the point of the GameCube. If the screen had been released and Yuji Naka and Miyamoto's PSO3 collab had been a blockbuster, things might have been very different, although on second thought, this might have messed with Naka's recent canon event. These expensive slash unreleased innovations, and with coming in third in home console sales during the entire generation aside, Perrin Kaplan looked back on this time at Nintendo with a positive outlook. With GameCube, we made money and it was profitable, and that's something I think is sometimes really missed by the public. The others were bleeding, and we were still profitable. One of the challenges that we always had with GameCube is that Nintendo has always been an incredibly profitable profitable company, and we saw ourselves as different from Microsoft and Sony, but externally, we would still be judged in a lineup. But it was the popularity of the GBA, a platform that was still offering comparatively simple games, which gave way to the Nintendo DS, which proved to be fairly successful during its initial 2005 launch before the clean, sleek lines of the DS Lite really pushed the hardware into the stratosphere. It's quite possible that the GameCube's lack of meaningful innovations led directly into the DS being arguably the most different thing released at that time, clearly paving its own way forward with a variety of unique features. Nintendo actually looked back to an earlier GameCube controller prototype and decided that it would be that X Factor, that killer new feature that they would entirely base their next home console around. At the same time as GameCube, Nintendo was secretly working on a revolutionary controller sensor idea that was very time-consuming work that ultimately never got filtered into our GameCube development, but after several years, this did produce the Wii Remote. The Wii is essentially a GameCube with some numbers doubled, but in a different colored box. But it's the Wii Remote that brought the extra thing that won Nintendo the market. That's how fine the margins are sometimes. Satoru Iwata had told investors to expect the GameCube to sell 50 million consoles by March of 2005, and while we can all appreciate the man's legendary positivity, he was a little off on that estimate. By the time the console was discontinued in 2007, it had moved 21 million units, placing it firmly below the N64, where it would remain until eventually being bested by the Waz U. Hey all! These plummeting sales were ultimately the thing that lit a massive fire under Nintendo's red racetrack ass and got them to refocus their vision on where they thought the industry should head. They put all their bets on the Wii and its motion controller, and while it still couldn't dethrone Sony's original PlayStation in terms of worldwide sales numbers, the Wii came pretty damn close. But many Nintendo fans still hold the GameCube incredibly near and dear to their hearts. Whether whether it's the legions of Melee players who still use actual hardware for tournament setups, the Psychos who salivate at the mention of Custom Robo or Kirby Air Ride, or the litany of players who discover the console through the incredible Dolphin emulator, the GameCube is still more than just a fond memory for many a gamer. While it's been a bit of a bumpy ride since then, it's unmistakable that the many mistakes of the GameCube are an indelible part of what made Nintendo into the company it is is today. So good job, you weird geometric shaped indigo son of a bitch. If you know of any other games, movies, or consoles that had a weird or confusing development journey, do let me know in the comments below or over on my Twitter. A really good example of one such project would be Star Fox Grand Prix, a long rumored but never confirmed entry in the series allegedly developed by Retro Studios. If you head on over to Did You Know Gaming and check out their newest video which I narrated, you'll find out if this space animal racing game actually existed at some point. Link in the description and in the pinned comment below. See you next time and thanks for watching!
In 2003, shortly after the release of Metroid Fusion, longtime series Shepard Yoshio Sakamoto said in an interview, If I can, I want the series to keep going. From here on out, I think I want to develop Samus as a character. I might also want to create a story going back to the past of Adam and Samus. <laughs> Hey, it's me, Matthew, your husky host for another episode of What Happened, which today is being made possible by Flophouse VIP Big Boss Ian, who officially nominated the 2010 Nintendo Wii classic, Babyoid Other Baby. Ah, yes, the very last non-remake, non-spin-off entry in the well-loved Metroid franchise, which I can now finally talk about on this show, after a long long time of not talking about it. So, right out the gate, I'm going to be completely honest. This might be a very different episode than what you're accustomed to, because in the past, we've heard horrific tales about meddling marketing executives, disastrous engine switches, or just simple hot jars of moldy mayonnaise masquerading as people. When it comes to Metroid Other M, though, things get a lot more simple, like a lot more direct, but nevertheless, it still carries that distinct waft of what the hell happened. So make sure you have the proper authorization from your commanding officer, because we're going to delve deep into the story of how the creator of Metroid almost killed Metroid. It's 2002, and Nintendo brought back their sci-fi action franchise to the GameCube with Metroid Prime, whose green light was probably bolstered by the amount of young kids playing Smash Brothers in 99 and 2000, asking, what's the Samus? Anyway, we're not going to get into the nitty and or gritty of Metroid Prime here, as its development was a whole other thing, a very risky and experimental take on the series that shouldn't have worked. Like, at all, but became one of the reasons to own Nintendo's purple lunchbox. Along with it, perhaps as a precaution, they also fast-tracked a less expensive, safer bet with the aforementioned Metroid Fusion, a familiar-feeling 2D side-scroller for the Game Boy Advance. There hadn't been a new entry in the franchise since 1994, and since then, the Castlevania series had become the standard bearer for, um, Metroidvanias, or to be more accurate, the genre which from now should be known as search action. God, that's so great! Sakamoto, a designer and artist for the NES original and director of one of the greatest games of all time, Super Metroid, was tasked with handling Fusion and had very little input on the Prime series overall. Now, in terms of fan expectations, and even probably internally within Nintendo, it would be easy to assume that Fusion was going to be the slam dunk. It had an original creator working on it, and it was firmly sticking to its 2D roots. However, it was Metroid Prime that took most of the limelight, with Fusion being more of an afterthought in a lot of people's minds. Still, an extremely solid game in its own right, but its added narrative elements and character dialogue and slightly more linear gameplay and mission structure caused some to view it as inferior when stacked up against the mighty Super Metroid. Meanwhile, the Prime series only kept building with phenomenal reviews and strong sales. Echoes followed two years later, and Nintendo ushered in both the Wii and DS generations with Corruption and Hunters, respectively, and both were made by Western Studios, as well as pushing first person as the dominant style for the series. Conversely, Sakamoto and his team were tasked with doing a simple remake of the original NES outing with Zero Mission, an entry that again, while good, was overshadowed as it came out only a few months before the launch of the Nintendo DS, which um, kind of became a big deal. So, that brings us back to Sakamoto's quote from 2003, where he put forward his idea to implement more story into the Metroid universe, and it's pretty easy to deduce why. The Prime series kept Samus as silent as possible, and was emphasizing complex 3D maps, puzzles, and new control methods. The 2D Metroid team at Nintendo of Japan couldn't really compete in those areas, but what they could do was offer something different. 
After Corruption's release in 2007, Retro Studios banana slammed into DK Island with Donkey Kong Country Returns, leaving a rare gap in Metroid releases, a gap that Sakamoto was quick to pounce on. The problem, though, was that Nintendo was firmly pushing forward with 3D games by this time, something that the Metroid handheld team had no idea how to do. The thought came to me that I could make something pretty amazing if I were to create a Metroid for Wii, but when it came to the actual development process, my team, to be completely honest, didn't have the know-how or the experience to develop something for 3D. That and we didn't have the manpower either. I realized that I'd probably need to find a partner, someone to collaborate with in making my concepts a reality. I was looking for someone who not only understood my concept, but would also be able to contribute with their own experience. Experience. I was very fortunate at that time to speak with Mr. Hayashi and the team at Team Ninja. Ah yes, Team Ninja. In 2008, Captain Oatmeal Face was busy quitting slash being fired from Tecmo, which left Yosuke Hayashi in charge of the Ninja Dojo. Hayashi, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, felt it would be a hearty challenge to help Sakamoto realize his vision, and also to provide programmers who actually understood 3D development. Team Ninja also supplied the engine, which was apparently a heavily modified version of what powered the first two Ninja Gaidens, as well as 3D artists and modelers. There is also a third player here, D-Rockets, a CGI studio who Team Ninja had worked with before on prior games. They bear special mention, because instead of just providing an intro, an ending, and calling it a day, they would need to provide a good deal more of CGI animation, and when I say a good deal more, I mean a metric fucking shit ton. This is because Sakamoto, in his bid to provide something different than what was being offered by the Prime series, decided the world should peruse every single bland, uninteresting hallway of Samus Aran's Mind Palace. Shortly after Other M's formal announcement, both Sakamoto and Hayashi provided some, uh, in retrospect, hilarious quotes. The Other M story will tie together what took place in Super Metroid and Metroid Fusion. One of my goals is to present Samus as an appealing human character, and that involves explaining a little bit about what happened in her past as well as the characters that influenced her. The story will play a big part. Of course, Metroid is a very sophisticated action game as well, so our goal is to create an experience that is seamless between the cinematics and the actual gameplay. Hayashi's statement has aged even worse. One of our concepts that we like to keep in mind as we're progressing through development is to create Samus as this very appealing character, the ultimate female hero in the game universe, so we're keeping that in mind. Yeah, well, you failed. Now, Nintendo usually shies away from delving too deep into the personal backstories of its characters, and instead opts to immerse you more within the worlds themselves through clever level design, NPC dialogue, fun challenges, or just through pure atmosphere. Metroid's core appeal, however, was just how mysterious everything was. Outside of some obscure comics, you never learn much about Samus' past, the motivations of the space pirates, other than them being evil, of course, because the earlier games always prioritized the gameplay, first and foremost. While playing Super Metroid, did you ever look at Samus while she's doing the Shine Spark and say, Man, what is going on inside her head? No, you didn't, but Sakamoto thought you did. So Other M was loaded up not with super missiles or power bombs, but with hours of cutscenes, introducing a multitude of characters that some people might have been familiar with, but many others would not be. Remember me? The main point of contention was the characterization of Samus and her relationship with one Adam Malkovich, a general in the Galactic Federation. When a character has been silent and mysterious for literal decades, you're setting yourself up for disaster if you don't handle it perfectly. And fortunately, Samus the baby. was not I was childish. handled and the baby. perfectly. If something like that happened again, I would hold fast to that glimmer of hope and try for redemption. In a combination of perhaps misguided voice direction, mistranslation, or misinterpretation of the script, or just having a horrible script, Other M in many fans' eyes is the scene of a crime. 
the crime of character assassination. In Other M, she's presented as whiny and overly emotional, while simultaneously also being wooden and unassuming. And these are the impressions most had of Samus through the various trailers and previews leading up to Other M's release, and were only exponentially worsened when people actually played the game. Me? I was known for giving the thumbs down during briefings. And we haven't even talked about the actual game yet, because aside from the bloated and divisive story, there was a whole other set of issues when it came to the mechanics. Sakamoto wanted to force the concept of art out of adversity, which is something you should never force if you have a choice. He wanted to make, and I'm quoting him here, a Metroid game anyone can play. So he decided that Samus would be controlled by a single Wii remote forcing the developers to think outside the box on how to get all of this to work, how to make a complicated search action game function with a limited set of buttons. I mean, you know, thank God, because by 2010, everyone was sick to death of that awfully complicated uh, nunchuck. It's just so, yeah, what is, what is this? <laughs> The solution was for about 85% of the game to be played via the NES style of holding the Wii remote, with the remaining 15% tasking the player to clunkily swing the remote forward to switch to a first-person mode, which will allow you to attack in first person. This was primarily used for boss fights and the just really weird and awkward point-and-click investigative sections, which again was something many felt didn't really work. It was trying to be both a fast 2.5D action platformer and a first person shooter, sometimes. That blistering fast 2.5D action was the one thing that Team Ninja brought to the table that at least felt a bit refreshing. The game was gorgeous for the Wii, ran at a silky frame rate, and had some amazing fighting animations for the finishing moves that weren't too over the top for the franchise, instead fitting snugly just under the top. Because of all this, however, Samus was a bit too incredibly overpowered. Her new dodge move gave her complete invincibility ability from enemy attack, she could recover both health and missiles by simply charging a button, and the sense of dread and isolation Metroid was known for certainly didn't feel very dreadful or isolating. You were absolutely beasting on bosses and bopping their shit while yucking it up with a platoon of soldiers, John Malkovich, and a bunch of nerds throughout the entire story. In terms of gameplay, probably the most egregious change and part of Sakamoto's A Metroid Anyone Can Play mantra was the exploration had been greatly reduced. You acquired the least amount of new items in any Metroid up to that point. There was also like one extra suit that barely looked any different, and since Adam needed to give Samus permission to use 90% of her shit, you didn't need to explore to find 90% of her shit. You just needed to progress in the story. Simply put, almost every core aspect of the series was either simplified or stripped out altogether. You know, why have exploration or power-ups or a heavy atmosphere when you can just have the baby, the deleter, the baby, the baby, delete, 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 delete. De so, other M was um, received much more savagely from fans more so than critics, but even positive reviews would make mention of the game's flaws, and due to whatever other factors, wound up being a sales disappointment for Nintendo, with former president of NOA, Reggie Filzame, stating as such shortly after it launched. We believe that Metroid Other M should be a million unit title. We're not going to get there, not through the holiday, and we are doing a lot of thinking as to why. Because it's a great game. The consumer reaction, because of the quality, has been strong. I think the marketing was strong, advertising was very good, and the social media we did was very positive. Well, Nintendo certainly took their time thinking because for the next decade, they released only two other titles featuring the intergalactic bounty hunter that fits inside a time 
tiny metal ball. Those games were of course the 3DS spin-off Federation Force and the remake of the Game Boy title Return of Samus, with both having uh, minimal involvement by Sakamoto. In fact, ever since Other M, Sakamoto has been relegated to producing Wario Wares, Rhythm Heavens, Tamadachi Life, and some various other obscure fare. Now, here's the thing. Everything I just outlined about Other M, the, the story, the gameplay, the controls, everything went exactly as planned. It it was textbook. Nintendo didn't interfere or try to dilute the director's vision. There was no significant engine problems. The three teams had enough manpower and budget, and the entire project lasted for a svelte three years. Sakamoto has since claimed that if he was to do Metroid Other M all over again, he wouldn't change a thing, and that he regretted absolutely no decisions made on the project. He also felt that there wasn't really any aspect that could have been done any better, and that he saw his entire vision all the way through to completion, which I guess is pretty admirable. Sticking to your guns despite many, many, many opinions to the contrary. Fortunately, Metroid Prime 4 was announced in 2017, under development by a mysterious, still unnamed studio that was based maybe in Japan or China, was then cancelled and then restarted development from the ground up back at Retro Studios, who were working on their own unannounced title up until then, which uh, may or may not be cancelled. Okay, so I guess in the next few years we might be slipping on the various suit once again here on what happened. Thanks once more to Ian for nominating the baby for this week's episode. And if you'd like to do much of the same, spider ball your way into the Flophouse VIP Patreon to force me to tackle the game or movie you'd like to see in the future. See you next time, and thanks for watching. And welcome to another swear-laden, alcohol-raging, and squirrel-butt-shaking episode of What Happened, the show that reaches into the mountains of muck to pull out the wildest stories from deep within the gaming industry. <laughs> this is gonna be interesting. You probably already noticed from the title and or thumbnail, but this week's episode is all about a game from the legendary studio known as Rare. Uh, again! Despite having a legion of old school fans and an incredible back catalog, Rare are no stranger to our stage, and I wouldn't have it any other way. The Rare of old exemplified one of the best types of studio in my book, one that took creative risks left and right and just made what they wanted to make. And there's no better evidence of that than a game about a hungover, foul-mouthed British woodland creature who stumbles into becoming a god emperor whilst lampooning the Matrix, Clockwork Orange, and saving Private Ryan. This is crazy! The game is a veritable drunken dream, somehow simultaneously managing all of its quirks while being both a technical showpiece and a downright fun time to boot. However, the road to conquer finally conquering development hell wasn't an easy one. It took almost five years, a near cancellation, and a full reboot to get there, so it all very much begs the question, what happened to Conquer's Bad Fur Day? It's gonna be one of those days. It was 1996, and the, the Nintendo Ultra 64 had just made a pretty respectable splash at retail, primarily driven by the breakthrough that was Super Mario 64. You, uh, might have heard of it. Rare had been working with Nintendo at that time, pumping out various titles like Blast Core, GoldenEye, and Killer Instinct Gold, but once Mario butt-slammed his way into the marketplace, it sent ripples throughout the gaming industry at large, providing a handy guide on how to nail platformers in full 3D. The team that had just finished KI Gold took notice of the plumber's blockbuster success and started working on their own 3D platformer. This is funny because despite Rare eventually shipping tons of said 3D platformers, Conker's Quest was actually their first go at it, and ironically, their last on the Nintendo 64. 
As stated in my Donkey Kong video, Rare's fourth DK game actually started life as a 2.5D platformer, while their other big project was still stuck in its awkward teenage RPG phase, where it was known as Project Dream. Headlined by this Sudeki looking Dorcas right here. During the beginning of production, Rare co-founder Tim I refused to leak KI2's SNES build Stamper had apparently suggested to the KI team that their 3D platformer should star a cutesy main character in order to help the game cast a wider net and also presumably so Rare could have a new mascot to call their own. With that in mind, the team set about constructing colorful environments and getting a squirrel they named Conker running around in them fairly quickly. According to an article in Unseen 64, the studio's teams were, at that time, kept pretty separate from one another, which in part instilled a certain quote, healthy rivalry between each team, according to X-Rare staffer Steve Males. They tended to not be fully aware of each other's projects, and according to a Conker's BFD Let's Play hosted by Chris Sevor, once the Project Dream staff saw an early version of Conker, they decided to scrap everything they were doing and to start their own 3D platformer, with a bear and bird in the title role. Uh, this will be very important later. At E3 1997, Nintendo publicly unveiled both games as Conker's Quest and Banjo-Kazooie, with the press noting some rather big similarities between the two. Chris Sevor, who started as an artist on Conker, echoed those statements in issue 174 of Retro Gamer magazine. The Donkey Kong lot were the Golden Boys, and I don't think much was expected of the outcasts in the other barn. Uh, I'm being facetious, of course, but it serves to illustrate the state of play at that moment. Conquer, even though it was more similar to Mario 64 in terms of tone than cancelled rare RPG Project Dream initially, was the one that had to change after Banjo-Kazooie became a thing. Having two cutesy first-party 3D platformers coming out at the same time on the same console was questionable, but from the same studio wasn't an option. Banjo was Tim Stamper's baby. Anyway, Conker's gameplay continued to take shape, with the team giving him a girlfriend character by the name of Barry who could help traverse the game's levels, collect nuts, and a bunch of other bog-standard platformer activities. Despite these additions, every time it was shown to the press, the general consensus continued to be that Banjo was the heavy favorite. Uh -huh. Outlets like N64.com felt that Banjo's camera control was more fluid, with Ultra Game Player saying that Conker's overly cutesy aesthetic was uh, borderline disturbing. The friendly competition between the two would continue later that same year, when both mascots popped up in Diddy Kong Racing towards the end of 1997, only to be destroyed by the all-encompassing savage god-beast energy that is Timber. Actually, going back to DKR today, though, might be kinda weird for some people. While well, Banjo is his same lovable self, I'm Banjo! Conker is a gormless, smiley thumbs-upper, something that absolutely needed to change if he was going to continue to exist. In 1998, Rare decided that, among other things, a name change was in order for the project. Conker's Quest wasn't exactly the most glitzy moniker, so it was renamed to 12 Tales Conker 64. The team also felt that adding a multiplayer suite with both competitive and cooperative modes would help differentiate it from Banjo, which only offered a single player experience. Speaking of single player, more elements were being added to Conker, including Barry being able to hop on a dinosaur buddy to take out enemies. All these changes and additions also resulted in delays, so while the Banjo team started to approach the finish line, the Conquer team conversely started losing confidence in their game and its continued identity crisis. Meanwhile, a deluge of colorful mascot platformers began jumping and or bopping onto the N64, headlined by such luminaries as Chameleon Twist, Glover, and the other ones. So by this point, Conker was going to be late to the party no matter how they tackled it, putting the team in quite the pickle. 
Canceling or rebooting it into another genre wasn't really an option, as the Stampers had been so gung-ho about Conker's potential that they had also greenlit a GBC title, Conker's Pocket Tales, which had been going smoothly. Thus, the team continued to plug away in somewhat of a funk, not really knowing what to do next, which only resulted in more delays. Rare artist and character designer Don Murphy went on record with Emily Rogers in 2012, saying bluntly, 12 Tales, to put it politely, was not a good game. Software engineer Chris Marlowe also shared that sentiment during an interview in the Rare Replay Supplemental Materials with, There was an awful lot of content and there were lots of fun ideas, but it just really wasn't gelling as a finished game. With the team floundering and Banjo-Kazooie becoming Rare's big 1998 smash success, the threat of cancellation was starting to look like a very real possibility. They either needed to come up with a solution or throw everything in the bin and move on to something else. So, in early 1999, Chris Seavord took the initiative and brought an idea to the Stampers in a bid to save Conker's life which was, instead of having him collecting nuts, wearing hats, and smiling, he would swear, drink, and, unbeknownst to them at the time, fight literal piles of shit. In his own words, the initial idea was a simple one. Conker is an innocent who wanders into difficult situations and inadvertently causes even more mayhem, before wandering off, not looking back. Conker genuinely wants to help people, but doesn't quite manage it. I thought that would be funny. It sort of evolved from there, really. As Tolkien once said, the tale grew in the telling, or in other words, I made the fucker up as I went along. You try doing that now in the industry? Pugger me. The planners would have an epileptic aneurysm. The response from the stampers to all of this was along the lines of, I love it! The new direction was genuinely bold and fresh, emphasizing narrative and humor over collecting scores of boobly wooblies or whatever it is that the British love to collect. With the Stampers' green light and a promotion for Chris to project leader, development on Conquer was restarted, although obviously they had a decent amount of existing assets and technology at their disposal. Many new characters were created during this process, while others got some pretty drastic makeovers cut to a comparison pick of Barry right now. Conquer, in a rather odd but brilliant move, not only stayed the same, but got even cuter. In that same issue of Retro Gamer I mentioned earlier, Chris explained this decision. That was one of the few things that carried over from 12 Tales, where the squirreliness of Conquer had more relevance. Indeed, his initial movement style was on four legs, jumping from point to point very much like his real-world counterpart. Generally, though, it's as good a cutesy character as any. In fact, if you looked at the character design from Twelve Tales, he became a lot more cutesy in Bad Fur Day, which juxtaposed nicely with the actual tone of the game. This restarting of development was obviously unknown to the general public, but by late 1999, questions from both the media and fans were becoming more and more insistent, asking, hey, whatever happened to Conquer 64? Is he cancelled? Well, well, not not the character himself, well, well nowadays Conquer would be, but, but was his video game cancelled? It got to the point where Rare had to say something, and in this case, it was on their official FAQ page. No, it hasn't. It's still being worked on by a full team and with the same level of dedication as when it was first announced. And that wasn't a lie. The change in direction completely reinvigorated the team, with everyone wanting to get in on the joke, as it were, contributing more gags, characters, and punchlines to the insane world Chris had created. So while things creatively were starting to fire on all cylinders, there was just one tiny thing left to take care of which was telling Nintendo that they were now publishing a game that had sunflowers with massive yabos. Despite my earlier foreshadowing, guess what? Nintendo were actually all like, um, okay, if you're sure. When informed that Conker would now be targeting a mature rating, complete with blood, alcohol, and tons of swearing. Again, Rare's games, along with Nintendo's own, were THE platinum sellers on the N64, so there was very little pushback from Nintendo except for two specific references that they asked to be removed. 
For those of you that are morbidly curious, the offending jokes were a reference to Pokemon, and on the polar opposite end of the spectrum, the, uh, well... Ku Klux Klan. Aside from that, Chris said that 99.9% .9 of all the edgy material they had wanted to include made it into the final game. With the creative juices cooking, development finally started to go smoothly. Pop culture references were sprinkled liberally throughout the game, forming the backbone of many of Conker's most iconic sequences, with the Saving Private Ryan one being a standout. In Retro Gamer, Chris admitted that the amount of work that went into that whole set piece was a game's worth in itself. It was decided that the camera system should also be more cinematic, since the gameplay was starting to revolve more on contextual interactions rather than platforming, so the team took inspiration from an unlikely source. Prince of Persia 3D was cited as an example of the type of camera angles that the Conquer team wanted to implement, but thankfully they did so to a much more successful degree. In terms of graphics, Rare engineers supposedly spent at least six weeks rewriting and optimizing Nintendo's provided microcode, which only featured comments in Japanese in order to support more advanced lighting and audio capabilities. All character interactions in Conquer were also fully voiced, so it became one of the very few N64 games to ship on a 64 megabyte cart, alongside other monster whoppers like Resident Evil 2. Even with that, the team ultimately couldn't cram absolutely everything in, as there was still around 20% more content that they had planned but weren't able to finish, including lengthier sections involving Hell and Greg, the boss fight with the bull being even more extensive, I can't imagine that, and the windmill containing several additional characters and storyline sequences. In Chris's own words that he shared with Retro Gamer, time was and is always the great enemy. Where'd you get that from, a fortune cookie? Then, after a tremendously long-winded development, Conker's Bad Fur Day was set to be unleashed on the gaming world in March 2001, just months away from the GameCube's debut later that year. The launch of their new console was obviously where most of Nintendo's attention was, so when they decided to publish Conker... Wait, wait no, they, they didn't publish Conker. What? Wait, is this a Mandela Effect thing? I I'm aware that the European publishing rights were snapped up by THQ, but the North American version was self-published by Rare. Bizarre. I guess Nintendo didn't want any of that smoke, which might explain why they decided against using any of their regular marketing avenues, chiefly Nintendo Power, which just stopped mentioning Conquer the second the potty humor started to bubble up from the toilet. They just straight up ghosted it. This meant that gamers who used NP as their main source of information for upcoming releases might not even know Conquer had come out. Subscriber counts for NP aren't widely available, but based on the little data that's out there, they likely had a readership in the hundreds of thousands around that time frame. It was an important arm of Nintendo's marketing strategy, so a major game getting skipped entirely wasn't really going to help matters. While Nintendo had their name taken off the box, marketing was still handled and funded by them. A company by the name of Starcom did the actual dirty work. They held promotions and events in college campuses, bars, as well as late night TV and even adult magazines. But nowhere else. Not on websites, Saturday morning cartoon blocks, or even in comic books. This was obviously because Nintendo wasn't comfortable with promoting such quote-unquote mature content, and unfortunately their worries weren't entirely unfounded. KB Toys refused to stock it. Newspapers like the Los Angeles Times wrote up stories about how the once pure Chase Nintendo had suddenly decided to peddle smut to miners. They even got quotes from a mom in Indiana who said, after buying the M-rated game for her 15-year-old, this is disgusting sophomoric humor and I'm disappointed in Nintendo. It's like Disney releasing pornography. The obvious problem with this marketing approach for an upcoming Nintendo game was that it was aimed at a very specific demographic that probably wasn't interested in Nintendo games, given the meteoric rise of the PlayStation brand. Why buy the erotic Squirrel Poo game when Red Faction 2, Twisted Metal Black, and Final Fantasy X were on the horizon? 
Unfortunately, and this shouldn't surprise anyone, Conker's bad fur day Jaeger bombed at retail. Information leaked to IGN back in the day points at the game moving less than 55,000 copies in North America during its first month, with the leaked figures specifying that the game was doing worse and worse as time went on. This is the old proverbial shame, as the gaming media heaped tons of praise on Rare's wild and weird gamble. It landed incredibly high review scores across the board, and without a doubt lived up to Rare's already very lofty standards. This was the freshest, most unique thing they'd released in years, breaking away from the collectathon conveyor belt the studio had gradually become, and delivering a truly creative vision. Despite the disastrous sales, the Conquer team briefly worked on a sequel, Conquer's Other Bad Day, which would have directly followed up from the original's ending. This was unfortunately happening right in the middle of Rare's ownership switching hands, with Microsoft rejecting the continued development of Other Bad Day once the Conquer ball had bounced into their court. Eventually, a remake with expanded online multiplayer was released right at the tail end of the Xbox's life, so Conquer Live and Reloaded achieved better, but still fairly flaccid sales. According to NPD Group, it sold around 150,000 units in its launch month, which, while not dreadful, was still not the type of sales that you'd hope for from a big exclusive. Chris then pitched another sequel, this time trying to appeal to Microsoft's penchant for pushing games with Xbox Live functionality, with Conquer getting medieval, which was set to dispense with the single-player story altogether and go all-in on the well-received multiplayer aspects seen in Live and Reloaded. If I'm sounding like a broken record here, I apologize, but Microsoft also rejected this pitch. Then, after completing work on 2010's Kinect Sports, Chris Sevor decided to move on, quitting Rare after over 15 years at the studio. Conquer wasn't so lucky, remaining locked within the Microsoft vaults with no chance of escape. Kinda. In 2014, fans around the world rejoiced to see the jumped up little bugger return in Project Spark. <laughs> I wasn't even aware of this, but apparently the first content pack that featured a new story, which was a canon follow-up to Bad Fur Day, dubbed Conker's Big Reunion, actually came out. Well, part of it. It was meant to follow an episodic model, and although the first one did make it out, the following episodes weren't so lucky, which was just oh-so 2015-era Microsoft. Chris Sevor even came back to voice Little Guy before it all went ass up, so it was a shame it ended so abruptly. And the less said about Conker's weird HoloLens appearance, the better. Except that you can actually still play it, but that might be something for Uncle Derek to fart around with, if he can afford it. Eventually, a bone was thrown to Conquer fans in the form of Rare Replay, one of the best collections ever released, as it contains the original N64 version of Bad Fur Day, fully playable and shinier than ever on modern Xboxes. Chris would go on to an independent career with his own startup, Gory Detail, with his last project being the odd but charming The Unlikely Legend of Rusty Pup. As is tradition, I'll summarize this episode in the same way I end a lot of Rare Focus videos. They made a super cool thing once, some wacky stuff happened, Microsoft proceeded to do the bare minimum with said cool thing, which has now resulted in long periods of absolutely nothing. In 2023, this is now a very sobering reminder that Conker's Bad Fur Day has been stretched into some bad fur years. Well, so ends another incident in my day. Thanks goes out to Daily Kong for her help with this video. And if you know of any other squirrely developments in the video game or movie industries, let me know in the comments below or over on my Twitter. See you next time and thanks for watching!
Welcome once again to another alien blasting vehicle jacking episode of What Happened, the show that regularly reaches back into the realm of hallowed antiquity and pulls out the stuff that had a rough time getting there. This week's episode is squarely targeted on a 1998 release that some of you might not even remember. It was a pretty good year for video games after all, but those of you that do are probably nodding wistfully right now. Body Harvest may seem like your average and 64 action title, weird name, massive insect overlord, dude in awkward orange armor, etc. But the story behind its creation is what's really extraordinary. It's one that left endless ripples in the well of eternity. Ripples that are still felt across the universe to this day, or just actually just the video game industry. It's a tale of lofty ambitions, globe-spanning voyages, ignoring leadership decisions, and very near cancellations. So put on your dorky helmet and hop into the nearest vehicle, because it's time to find out what happened to Body Harvest. It's harvest time again. Our story begins with DMA Design, you know, this inconspicuous logo right here. It was founded in the late 80s by What Happened All-Star David Jones, who last popped up in our episode about the massive confusing disaster that was APB, which I'm honestly still recovering from. Anyway, if you were playing video games in or around 1991, you would have most likely seen this logo in front of the many, many ports, sequels, and spin-offs of Lemmings, the seminal puzzle platformer that unarguably put DMA design on the map. This Dundee, Scotland-based studio had been growing rapidly through the sustained success of these dopey rodents, or whatever the hell they're supposed to be. They then staffed up alongside all the projects that had begun to come their way. All this big noise about DMA design then eventually caught Nintendo's eye, who then contracted them to create Uniracers, an underappreciated SNES classic where you control bloodthirsty, sentient unicycles. Aside from Uniracers crashing into a legal battle with Pixar that resulted in Nintendo having to stop production of the game, a story for another time perhaps, the partnership went so well that Nintendo drafted DMA Design to be a part of their dream team, a stable of studios composed entirely of Western developers to provide games for their upcoming Nintendo Ultra 64. Nintendo Power pulled back the curtain on this stable in their April 1995 issue, walking readers through the upcoming Ultra 64. 64 hardware and a list of all the developers who were on board, which would surely hype up even the most jaded Nintendo fan. The Dream Team was a fascinating but odd move for the company, as it very clearly placed emphasis on international partners rather than the usual suspects. Perhaps Nintendo had took for granted those usual suspects like Capcom, Konami, and Square, and just assumed they would provide headliner launch titles, which they didn't. So, Nintendo did what they could, which was to attract foreign companies like LucasArts, Acclaim, Game Tech, and Time Warner Interactive, which was certainly a killer's row. No, wait, the, the, the opposite of a, of a killer's row. A victim's column? Regardless, Nintendo was hopeful that this dream team could really elevate and diversify their N64 output, and DMA Design were hyped to be a part of it, as they had been big fans of Nintendo's franchises and design philosophy. They were probably even more stoked when the two pitches they proposed to the publisher were almost immediately greenlit, in addition to a third N64 project under another company. Yeah, this additional third game isn't really all that important to the story, but screw it! Big ups to the always fantastical Space Station Silicon Valley. Anyways, Body Harvest started life as something quite tonally different from what we eventually got. In a Eurogamer interview with designer Brian Bagley, he spoke about some of the game's original inspirations. It was the B-movies of the 50s that really gave Body Harvest its heart. The Blob, Them, even Plan 9 from Outer Space. The notion of evil aliens showing up at various points in Earth's history to harvest humans for food and resources was so cheesy that it fit into Nintendo's family-friendly ethos while giving the game a real differentiator in terms of look and feel. With the inspiration in place, the Body Harvest team then plugged away on the game's core concepts, which were, according to the same interview, regularly hampered by the N64's architecture. 
As I recall, the development tools were never quite up to scratch. There was a constant struggle to get the dev kit to do what was needed and what was claimed in the specification. And because it was proprietary tech, we couldn't even engineer our own solutions to the problems. Even after two solid years of development, there were still issues. The gameplay loop just wasn't working, and what Nintendo was seeing also differed from the design documents that had been okayed with them in the first place. To help get the project on track, Nintendo flew out a few employees to pitch in, and while the Body Harvest team appreciated this as it showed Nintendo's dedication to the project, this visit wound up rubbing some DMA staff the wrong way, specifically when Nintendo made the tiny any suggestion that Body Harvest should completely switch genres after they had already been working on it for at least 24 months. Nintendo strongly felt that the premise of a lone warrior fighting against an alien invasion would work better as an RPG, which was a genre that the N64 was kinda always lacking. As you'd expect, this suggestion uh, ruffled some feathers. In Volume 121 of Edge Magazine, the Girl Issue, another designer by the name of Richard Ralph shared his perspective on the visit. Nintendo's input was greatly appreciated, but provided massive headaches for us. Its focus for the game was very different from the original concept. We had problems with their reasoning initially, but after sitting down discussing the possibilities, we came on board. Ultimately, since DMA agreed to this new direction, the Ningti staff flew back to Japan with the hope that Body Harvest was on the right track. The N64's launch had already long been missed, but they still understandably wanted to get a product out of this whole ordeal. To ensure that nothing more would go awry, Nintendo kept closer tabs on the game's progress, holding regular meetings with DMA producers with a translator as a go-between. These meetings, however, didn't go smoothly, with plenty of things gained lost in translation, which led to even more delays. Not only was the gameplay loop constantly in flux, Body Harvest's tone was also starting to change, as DMA design had begun shifting away from the original B-movie inspirations and into a more serious sci-fi epic, something that Nintendo of America and Japan began having differing opinions over. DMA Design staffer Steve Hammond wrote a column on Body Harvest back in 2012 for the Scottish Game Network where he explained the issue. Nintendo of America thought the time travel plot was fine, but would rather it was more detailed and complex. While that was okay, there had been a lot of detail left out of the game for reasons of space. Nintendo of Japan wanted it simplified. Later in the article, he rephrased the situation with a devastating elegance. Nintendo knew what they wanted and knew when they weren't getting it. The trouble was, Nintendo often didn't know what they wanted, and they definitely knew when they weren't getting that. Certainly some harsh words, but it's clear that Nintendo weren't exactly providing the silver bullets the project desperately needed to fix its problems, despite them still trying with conventional methods. Nintendo of Japan once again tried to take matters into their own hands with the opposite approach from what they attempted last time, inviting several members of the Body Harvest team to work alongside them in Japan for two weeks at their Tokyo headquarters. DMA staffers felt very much out of their element during their time there and were shell-shocked by the reveal that Nintendo's HQ wasn't filled with question blocks and rainbow roads, but a drab series of cubicles. Nonetheless, they were at least inspired by what they saw, which was specifically the methods of the team that was working on Star Fox 64. Producer slash programmer John White explained, We got to see their whole design approach and it just amazed us. They had a large room with post-it notes covering practically every inch of wall space. Once the two weeks were up, the team then flew back to Scotland, but they had an unwelcome surprise waiting for them. While they were in Japan, a decision had been made by the higher-ups. Their other Nintendo-contracted game, publicly known as Climber but internally as Zenith, was being cancelled, apparently done purely to staff up Body Harvest and get it where it needed to be. Zenith was described as a wacky racing game where players raced humanoid characters up vertical tracks via 3D platforming and the usage of various power-ups, and many on the team were quite proud of how it was coming along. 
Unfortunately, we don't really have a clear answer whether it was Nintendo or DMA design managers who canned Zenith, but we do know that the team behind it were given a choice. A false choice, really. Join the Body Harvest team or seek employment elsewhere, which unfortunately resulted in 10 people walking away from the studio. John White, for his part, tried his best to motivate the remaining staff to get them across that finish line, but given that he described the situation as trying to motivate people people who didn't want to be motivated, it sounds like it was a rough time. Something that the team found solace in, though, was making the choice to double down on what they had wanted to make from the start, an open-world action shooter with a heavy emphasis on controllable vehicles. The orange-suited hero, Adam Drake, would be able to commandeer a variety of cars, trucks, helicopters, and boats, and could even fire weapons while driving, bringing 3D gangland-style warfare to the invading alien hordes. This is just me theorizing, but this sudden switch back to the original vision might have been inspired by the runaway success of another little DMA design game called Grand Theft Auto, which had just been released in November of 1997 under another publisher. With their confidence swelling that they were now on the right track, Body Harvest really started to come together. While a lot of their ideas and open world design would come at the sacrifice of graphical fidelity and having to implement implement a lot of fog, the ability to let players tackle missions in whatever way they wanted was profoundly liberating, so the team felt they had finally nailed what they had set out to do. However, the company funding the whole entire project would strongly disagree. Nintendo was not pleased that DMA Design had basically gone against everything they had previously agreed on in regards to Body Harvest gameplay, and after two long, globe-spanning trips and several years worth of work and wads of money spent, drastic measures were coming. As far as we know, Nintendo simply chose to walk away from Body Harvest. They cancelled their publishing contract with DMA Design in the back half of 1997, which fortunately wasn't really the disaster you'd think it'd be. GTA had been an overnight success, and the title's controversial violence and content made headlines, which is almost never a bad thing. DMA Design had already been snapped up by Gremlin Interactive, who would eventually themselves be bought by Infogrames, and what happened favorite Midway would pick up the North American publishing rights to Body Harvest without much convincing from DMA Design. In the late 90s, Midway were attempting to diversify their gaming catalog with more console games and less arcade ones, so the timing worked out pretty nicely. Although, it really didn't work out pretty nicely for Midway long term as, uh, well, just check out this video here. Although with Midway's financial backing, DMA Design were able to put the finishing touches on this harvesting of bodies, although the ending to the story isn't quite as rosy as one would hope. Despite persevering through the technological issues, the conflicting and ever-changing design philosophies, a staff walkout, and a four-year-long development period, Body Harvest didn't exactly hit like DMA was hoping it would. The critical reception was decidedly mixed, with a number of reviewers admiring its scope and charm, but not being able to look past the dated visuals and performance issues. Even more damning, Body Harvest found itself smack dab in the middle of the white-hot gaming trend that was professional wrestling games, with WWF Warzone and WCW NWO Revenge on either side of it, just a few short weeks away from DMA's own Space Station Silicon Valley, and a small experimental little adventure title called this something, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, it doesn't matter. I couldn't find any hard data on Body Harvest sales, and while Midway's report for the period reported increased home video game revenue that quarter, Body Harvest featured no specific citation and was excluded from the list of their five best sellers for that period, which, you know, is, is somewhat telling. Now, even if Body Harvest had been a smash hit, make no mistake, Grand Theft Auto was still going to envelop the company and go 3D, and Body Harvest really wouldn't have factored into that equation much. 
Still though, I can't help but think about a timeline where Nintendo and DMA design really gelled during Body Harvest, resulting in a high quality launch game that would have moved consoles. If they had somehow managed that impossible task, there's no telling what could have happened to DMA design and the game industry at large. Nintendo had already heavily invested in Rare around that same time frame, so you could easily see them doing the same here. If that had come to pass, then there's a real chance Nintendo could have had a serious aversion to GTA subject matter, causing it to never exist, or having its content changed to fit Nintendo's more family-friendly image. Or hey, maybe eventually they might have given them carte blanche to make, you know, whatever they wanted, like they sometimes did with their other second parties. I am the great mighty Pooh. Geez, the, the mind overheats with the possibilities of it all. Fortunately, the people that worked on it directly still have great memories of it, with Brian Baglow saying, I love Body Harvest. It's one of the games that I still get asked about to this day and that many players remember very fondly. It had many problems and it faced many challenges, but I'm still very proud of it. So, while it's now a regularly forgotten chapter of DMA design, I, I mean Rockstar Norse history, hey, at least CJ remembers all the bodies that were harvested along the way. If you know of any other intergalactic gaming incidents, do let me know in the comments below, or take a truck, or boat, or a helicopter, or whatever, over to my Twitter. See you next time, and thanks for watching! What about now? It's time to rock with the big debug, Bumble. What about now? It's time to rock with the big debug, Bumble. Bump to the bump to the bump to the bass. Bump to the bump to the bump. Bump to the bump to the bump to the bass. Bump to the bump to the bump. Bump to the bump to the bump to the bass. Bump to the bump to the bump. Bump to the bump to the bump to the bass. Bump to the bump to the bump. Hello and welcome, my little Cheshires, to another flamboyantly stylish episode of What Happened, the show that takes a closer look at video games, movies, and etc. with fractured or prolonged development life cycles. And really, there are few games in the last decade that have exhibited those two elements more than Platinum Games' latest action spectacle. From long, long, long bouts of silence to a high-profile exit to, of course, a very public bit of voice acting drama. Our story today is rather notorious. So grab your tastiest lollipop and put on your most opulent pair of glasses, because it's time to find out what happened to Bayonetta 3. You have my deepest sympathies. Back during the Dark Ages of the Wii U, Nintendo was keen to get their hands on any exclusives they could, and with Platinum Games' Sega partnership having run its course, they were quick to snap up Bayonetta 2 as an exclusive, and as we all remember, everyone on the internet was extremely cool with that. The game didn't perform all that well on the Wii U, with the only confirmed number being 300,000 units in its first nine weeks, but aside from the game briefly getting shelved by Sega, its development appears to have gone relatively smoothly, with Nintendo and Platinum Games reportedly getting along very well despite clear differences in the types of games that they make. However, despite Bayo 2's critical acclaim, a third entry for the series wasn't immediately in the cards and would obviously be skipping the Wii U given the uh, state of the Wii U. Thankfully, this didn't mean Platinum Games and Nintendo weren't working together anymore. In spite of the colossal financial failure of some of their other Wii U projects, they were in fact already planning their next big team-up. Uh, it just wasn't Bayonetta. The following information about the inner workings of both Platinum Games and Nintendo's relationship around this time graciously comes from Imran Khan, who agreed to share various bits of information from multiple sources close to the project. For those not familiar with Imran, he's a former senior editor at Game Informer and was the first person who dropped some exclusive info regarding Bayo 3 on his Patreon a few weeks back, link in the description below. He helpfully prefaced his statements to me by saying, This timeline is to the best of my knowledge, with information I've gotten from people close and directly involved with development on the game. It's as accurate as I know it, but no one source knows everything, and even me trying to aggregate sources might have missed something here or there. All information should have an implied, as far as I know, before it. Either way, I hope this is helpful. As per his findings, Nintendo had asked Platinum Games for a brand new action IP to usher in the Switch, the criminally underplayed Astral Chain, which, according to Imran, started off quite differently as well. 
Platinum Games originally envisioned it as a medieval fantasy title before Nintendo stepped in and suggested they instead adopt a futuristic sci-fi aesthetic as they felt it would better suit the game. If this is the decision that gave us uh, Lappy and collecting sweet babies, then it absolutely 100% was the right one. While that was going on, Nintendo also tasked Platinum Games with a side mission, making a Switch port of both Bayonetta games, which would free Bayonetta 2 from the confines of the Wii U graveyard. What? Did Nintendo porting Wii U games very few people played over to the Switch? Why, that positively sounds like it was just all the time. Figuring since Nintendo was already asking for more Witch time, Platinum Games decided to shoot their shot and pitch Bayonetta 3 sometime early in this porting process, and Nintendo promptly agreed. The publisher then announced this with the quickness, which typically goes against their usual MO, and prepped a trailer for the 2017 Video Game Awards, which aside from a logo, showed very little. This is because that's literally all that existed of the game at this point in time. Imran's sources stated that all Platinum Games had was some concept art and a story treatment by Kamiya, so the trailer had to make do with minimal assets. While Hideki Kamiya was the director of the first game, he would take on a role as a supervisor for Bayonetta 2 and 3, with Yusuke Hashimoto taking the director's chair for both. Platinum Games had at the time been exploring more open, free-roaming structures in Nier Automata, Scalebound, and Astral Chain, and Hashimoto felt this could also be a good direction to take Bayo, with titles like Breath of the Wild and Batman Arkham City as inspiration. This had actually been hinted at publicly later on in 20. 19, when Platinum Game CEO Atsushi Anaba described a different development process for the game in an interview with VGC. With Bayonetta 1 and 2, we had basically an orthodox development process, at least for us. We did stage 1, then stage 2, then stage 3, and built up all the drama and pacing chronologically. For Bayonetta 3, we can say that we learned enough from making the past two games to change our process in a way that's different to what I just described. While Inaba played coy when the obvious follow-up questions came regarding whether this was referring to the game's structure or just the title's development, the dates line up, and I'd be willing to have hazard a guess that he was, indeed, teasing some form of a more open structure. But wait, you're thinking, Bayonetta 3 isn't open world at all. What happened? Well, that's what we're going to find out. The team plugged away on the game's new, more open nature in relative silence through 2018 and into 2019, but that's precisely when the first tiny setback for Bayonetta 3 occurred. Its director suddenly quit the company. In early 2019, Hashimoto took to Twitter, saying, This tweet will be a little more personal than usual. Yesterday, January 31st, this tweet was posted February 14th, was my last day at Platinum Games. The memories I made during my 13 years at Platinum, working with dozens of talented individuals on Bayonetta, Bayonetta 2, and Star Fox Zero, are priceless to me. Let me take this opportunity to share my thanks with anyone who has worked with me, supported me, or played my games. I hope to take the experiences I gained at Platinum and use them on whatever I work on in the future. Thank you again. Now, neither Nintendo nor Platinum Games ever officially detailed to the public who was actually working on Bayo 3 at that time, so this news largely went unnoticed by the majority of casual fans. He wound up returning to his old stomping grounds at Capcom and landed a designer position on Street Fighter 6, which he formally announced in February of 2022. But let's jump back to February 2019 and back to Platinum Games, where they were left with a very unfinished game with no director. Thus, another Yusuke, this time Miyata, was chosen to helm the ship, which was not a bad choice, as he had already worked on both Astral Chain and The Wonderful 101 as a designer himself. Hideki Kamiya shifted to a more hands-on role to better help the project as an executive director, with their plan being to continue with his and Hashimoto's original desire for an open-world game. However, according to Imran sources, this proved to be a lot more difficult than originally thought. The team was grappling with both design issues, such as properly pacing out the adventure, and technical problems related to the open world. The Switch is a great little machine, but it's no mystery that for a game with the level 
level of fidelity that Bayonetta 3 is pushing, it's going to be a struggle to get everything running perfectly. And even the much more linear final version puts the Switch through its paces. Now, I'm just assuming here, but squeezing in all those over-the-top effects and fancy new rendering techniques alongside the 60 FPS target the franchise is famous for in an open-world setting was probably a very hefty challenge. After trying to tackle all these issues well into 2020, Nintendo finally stepped in once again and advised Platinum on how best to proceed. They suggested ditching the open world concept altogether and instead focus what they had built into a more straightforward level-based structure. The game had already been in development for two plus years with very little to publicly show for it, and instead of taking a gamble on the open world concept that was clearly struggling, retooling the game game back into a more familiar mold was deemed the best course of action. Thus, several levels were condensed or split apart. You can see some evidence of this in a few of the game's maps, with the Isle of Thule being the most obvious. It's frankly pretty easy to imagine a version of the game with a more interconnected Thule map, where the portals fork off into various stages of the game like a bicycle wheel. Now, this is just guesswork on my part, but typically when you take resources like levels and retrofit them for another purpose, might start to run into problems with performance. What might seem simple to shrink a game down to run better doesn't really work that way when everything made up until that point was designed with a completely different purpose in mind, so this could have contributed to some of the visual and performance issues the final game exhibited, but we don't really know for sure until someone cracks open all the source files to check. But with the game's design and structure now in the middle of taking a huge shift, it really wasn't a great time to start publishing sizing Bayo 3 and putting out trailers or screenshots. But by summer of 2021, fans were obviously getting a little antsy. And it's not like Platinum Games hadn't already gone dark on a few previous projects only for them to get cancelled. Oh hey, look at that! But this endless speculation from fans obviously graded Hideki Kamiya's proverbial cheese. He reacted to these pleas for info in an interview with VGC in the summer of 2021, where he said, I understand it's driving the fans crazy. In light of that, my suggestion would be that maybe we should all reset and forget about Bayonetta 3. Then, when something finally does happen, it will be a nice surprise, won't it? Someone seems very interested in our arrival. As a quick sidebar, that's honestly a good bit of wisdom when waiting for any video game. No use frothing yourself into a tizzy over no news. Anyway, the internet obviously agreed and collectively forgot about Bayonetta 3 and absolutely did not mock his comment. But that's precisely when the aforementioned nice surprise finally did happen. In a regular, everyday September Nintendo Direct, when after 1,386 days of abject silence, we had our first real look at Bayonetta 3, showing off gameplay, cutscenes, and the promise of a 2022 release date. There was just one tiny area of concern. Eagle-eared fans of the franchise noticed a particular change. Bayonetta's voice actress was a completely different person. Does anyone mind if I cut in? Wouldn't want to step on anyone's toes. <laughs> Honestly, since this part of our tale went down not even too long ago, and I assume most of you probably already know it, I'm still going to give you a condensed version of the events, because I can't imagine the state of my comments section if I didn't at least touch upon it. In early October, just a few weeks out from Bayonetta 3's release date, Platinum Games confirmed that Helena Taylor, the original voice actress for Bayo in the first two games and her other appearances, would not be returning to the role, something the game's director, Miyata, announced via an interview with Game former. Various overlapping circumstances made it difficult for Helena Taylor to reprise her role. We held auditions to cast the new voice of Bayonetta and offered the role to Jennifer Hale, whom we felt was a very good match for the character. I understand the concerns some fans have about the voice change at this point in the series, but Jennifer's performance was way beyond what we could have imagined. I'm confident that her portrayal of Bayonetta will exceed our fans' expectations. 
Of course, some fans understandably grumbled about this change, but it's not completely unheard of, and honestly, winding up with Jennifer Hale as your lead is certainly no bad thing. The bad thing did happen 10 days later, where Helena Taylor took to Twitter and aired out a lot of dirty laundry, accusing Platinum Games of lowballing her with an insulting $4,000 offer to return to the role, which would indeed be ludicrously low for a leading character in the third game of a franchise. She also made the claim that Bayonetta was a series valued at over $450 million in revenue before merchandising, which seems a bit off considering the first two games combined have sold maybe three to three and a half million copies at best, so the math never really checked out there. She asked fans to boycott the game and instead give their money to charities, later suggesting one that's an anti-abortion group. Uh, okay. Regardless, a huge number of fans still took the accusations very seriously, and proceeded to hound Hideki Kamiya, who Taylor mentioned by name, and Platinum Games in general, whereupon Kamiya was quick to block the last few remaining people in the world he had not already blocked. He then didn't do many favors for himself by tweeting a single statement which read, Sad and deplorable about the attitude of untruth. That's what all I can tell now. By the way, beware of my rules. Before completely deactivating his Twitter account for a time, he came off as he was really, really pissed. But things had only just started. I see his motto is still act first, think later. Just three days later, Bloomberg's Jason Schreier received documentation and several corroborating accounts that alleged Taylor's version of the events left out a lot of critical info. She was initially offered $15,000 or possibly more to return to the role via a minimum of five four-hour recording sessions. This was about triple the minimum amount that SAG voice actors are required to be paid for voice roles. She turned this down and counter-offered for six figures and residuals, which considering the amount of recording time she was contracted for, would be an unusually high number in the industry. Platinum Games declined this counteroffer and opted to just recast Bayonetta entirely. They did, however, offer Taylor a cameo role in the game, which would only require one session, and pay out the same rate as one of the five individual sessions previously offered at $4,000. Taylor rejected this as well, and then simply walked away. Once this report was published, she claimed that it was a lie and stood by her story. Until she didn't. On October 24th, she took to Twitter once again, saying that she never asked for six figures, but did admit that Platinum Games had offered her a larger initial sum, which she did turn down, corroborating that bit of the Bloomberg piece. Jennifer Hale had also been on the receiving end of Twitter harassment, despite not being fully aware of the circumstances behind the scenes that had allowed her to get the role. She did put out her own statement. As a longtime member of the voice acting community, I support every actor's right to be paid well and have advocated consistently for this for years. I am under an NDA and I am not at liberty to speak regarding this situation. My reputation speaks for itself. I sincerely ask that everyone keep in mind that this game has been created by an entire team of hardworking, dedicated people, and I hope everyone will keep an open mind about what they've created. Finally, I hope that everyone involved may resolve their differences in an amicable and respectful way." Which was a statement supported by Platinum Games, who themselves offered a similarly plain but clear statement. So, with with the tie now very quickly turning, Helena Taylor seemed to want to distance herself from the controversy she herself had stirred up, saying to Bloomberg, I would like to put this whole bloody franchise behind me and quite frankly get on with my life in the theater. And that wasn't a snide joke or anything, by the way. It lines up with earlier tweets she had made about how she was done with video games and was planning to refocus on the theater anyway. Whew. While the whole situation was rather ugly, it did briefly bring up the legitimate issue of voice actors getting their fair share for iconic roles in successful franchises. And while Platinum Games did seem to go above and beyond the standard pay model, lots of other actors in the industry are not so lucky. In spite of the multi-million dollar success is enjoyed by lots of big franchises, actors, and indeed the vast majority of staff rarely ever see a dime in royalties. Many voice actors shared their 
past experiences in this regard, saying that disputes like this happen all the time, but typically behind closed doors. It's unfortunate that Taylor's case muddied the waters about the greater conversation, while she most likely blacklisted herself from the entire voice acting industry in the process, at least more people are now aware of the issue. The lack of royalties paid out to development and voice staff on big projects continues to be a frustrating reality in this day and age. And in this case, considering this was the third game in a series and a very recognizable character, Helena wasn't out of line to at least ask for the royalty part of her counteroffer. Regardless of her calls for a boycott, the controversy didn't seem to concretely affect Bayo3's return to the commercial arena. It cracked the top 10 of the NPD sales charts for October after only being on sale for two days in the tracking period, a feat that the franchise had never managed to accomplish before. It's a promising start, and when you consider that pretty much every major Nintendo release on Switch has leapfrogged previous non-Switch entries in sales, Bayo 3 is poised to be the biggest success in the franchise. Unfortunately, the aforementioned graphical and performance hiccups did mar the game's otherwise sublime action gameplay, with several big outlets, most notably Digital Foundry, shining a light on its technical shortcomings. And now, just recently, Hideki Kamiya started talking about a fourth Bayonetta, saying specifically that they would follow up on Bayo 3's ending, which was something some fans took issue with. But since it seems like this is very much a vanity franchise that they use to help placate their hardcore audience and not necessarily make a ton of money, I think there's still a good chance it could sashay into a future Nintendo Direct. Let's just hope it won't take nearly as long and be with much less controversy. A massive thanks goes out to Imran Khan for sharing all his info, and do check out his Patreon if you're looking for weekly news and reviews straight from a trusted source. And if you know of any other games or movies that took a long, long time to make, shout them out in the comments below or over on my Twitter. See you next time, Cheshires, and thanks for watching. once again to another episode of What Happened, the show that barrel rolls into games and movies with debilitating developmental drama. Now, that last one, drama, is not usually a word you'd use when talking about Nintendo. Well, I mean, I mean Frank, except for... And... And... Right, oh, okay, so they are not flawless, but when compared to many other companies we've discussed in the past, Nintendo's skeletons are few and far between, or locked up by NDAs most likely. One of their most recent misfires was 2016 Star Fox Zero, the most divisive game that the defenders of the Lilat system have had in a long, well, ever. What the heck is that? If I recall correctly, the last time Fox & Co. sailed the skies and stars on a Nintendo home console was 2005's Assault, followed by 2006's one and only DS outing, which then put the Corneria forces back into cryosleep for another five years. When Star Fox 64 hit the 3DS in 2011, well, it actually did very well for Nintendo and kicked off a small resurgence for the plucky crew of Little Animal Space Warriors. Unfortunately, the big game that resulted in was its Wii U entry, which shot down the franchise's return just as quickly, due to Nintendo's stubbornness in properly pushing the IP forward. So, open up your G-Diffusers and let loose your Nova Bombs, cause it's time to find out what happened to Star Fox Zero. As stated earlier, Fox McCloud was in a long slump after Namco's campaign against the Aperoids, but that didn't mean Nintendo had totally given up on it, just mostly. Oh no! Around 2008, there was an attempt to bring R-Wing action to the Wii, which would have made all the sense in the world. Games like Sin and Punishment 2 controlled like a dream with the Wii Remote and IR sensor, but for whatever reason it didn't coalesce into a robust game. Shigeru Miyamoto, you may have heard of him, explained in an interview with Wired in 2014 why this pitch never quite took off. Ha <laughs> ha! Getting in there with the 
Aviation puns, I love it. Oh, sorry. We originally began working with Star Fox back on Wii, and we had a small group of people experimenting with it for many years. Maybe about six years, but we didn't find an idea that really brought that together for the Wii. So instead, we moved experimentation to the Wii U using some of the same assets. It's been maybe six to ten months that we've been experimenting with it. While it's almost unbelievable to think that a team working for six years couldn't come up with a solid game design, you have to remember that the Star Fox series always strive to introduce something new with every entry. Star Fox 2's teams and persistent map, 64's expanded selection of vehicles and multiplayer, Assault, ground-based levels, and whatever it was that Command did. So, considering this is Nintendo, it's not super shocking that they didn't want to bring it back if they didn't have a new spice to bring to the table. Where's the flavor? Where's the flavor in this? I don't taste anything. Therefore, when development moved over to the Wii U, it was immediately cursed with the idea that it must use every single facet of the console, regardless of whether it was a good idea or not. Not only that, remember that this was around the time when Nintendo was desperately throwing stuff at the wall to see what would stick, which almost usually never sticks. Three of these wall-splattered destined ideas were shown to the press at E3 2014, all of which were apparently the brainchildren of Mr. Miyamoto. There was Project Giant Robo, Project Guard, and Star Fox Zero. For those who've wiped this area of their mind palace clean, Project Robo had you clunkily swinging your limbs around as giant bulbous robots, while Guard tasked you with defending a base as multiple sentry turrets from an invading force. Star Fox, however, saw you controlling an R-Wing from a, shall we say, unique perspective. To shoot and aim at enemies, you needed to hold the Wii U gamepad up at the screen like you were holding the throttle of a ship, while simultaneously pressing buttons to shoot. While not in the demo, the game was also planned to exclusively use the gamepad for other side missions whenever prompted. It was a confusing array of control schemes and screens, but unlike other Nintendo fare like Splatoon, there was no option for an alternative setup. Star Fox Zero's controls were brought up as a concern by Time Magazine, to which Miyamoto shrugged off in his usual manner. One of the things that stood out to me about the new Wii U and gamepad functionality is that it took a while to get used to and I'm still not sure I got it. Is there an intentional learning curve there? Yeah, I think that's safe to say. When we develop a game, I wind up playing it for many hundreds of hours, and so because of that, I tend to get a little further away from the experience people have when they're playing it for the first time. But that's something we always pay attention to when we're developing the game, and in this case, I think Star Fox will be a game you spend a little bit of time getting used to the controls, but once you do, then you'll understand what's fun about that experience. I don't think it'll take a lot of time for people to get used to it. For most people, it'll take 30 minutes to an hour. So from that standpoint, it's not a game that's particularly well suited to displaying at a show like this, where you only have a short amount of time to play. So that's why we held the event yesterday, to get everyone in to play for a longer period of time than they might normally. Unfortunately, the feedback from that press-only session, along with Nintendo of America's Treehouse, cited the controls as a problem, no matter how much time people spent with it. And it's tricky to learn the controls right away, because they do take some, taking, uh, some getting time to get used to. Right. Since you've got to learn to fly with one stick and then aim around with the gamepad, and so it's like, you, it's just a whole thing. It was simply not as accurate or satisfying having to juggle around the gamepad and look at both screens. The Wii U already had problems getting its gimmick across, and Star Fox Zero compounded the idea even further, taking an already complicated device and making it even more complicated, when all anyone wanted to do was just shoot weird space centipedes. Is that you, Slippy? With that said, fortune favors the bold. Like back in 2000, Alien Resurrection, the, the, the game, not the movie, it was heavily criticized for a control scheme that almost every publication epically shit on. If none of you ever played it, let me set the stage. You aimed your gun with the right control stick and you moved your character with the left one. Bizarre, I, I know. 
Nintendo then figured people just needed to get used to it, and since they had only been working on the game for less than a year, there was plenty of time for that yet. Speaking of time, Star Fox Zero, a name that would indicate to most that this was a prequel, was very much not. It was a remake of Star Fox 64, which in itself was more or less a remake of the original Super Nintendo Adventure. Now while other developers like Namco and Rare pushed the IP's overall narrative forward and introduced new characters, Zero remained slavishly devoted to 64, which just so happened to be the one entry Miyamoto had the most input on. This was still rather strange because the 3DS remake of 64 had just released a few years prior, so it was still fresh in most people's minds. Now, while I can't find a direct answer as to why they remade it again, the explanation most likely comes down to Miyamoto being in overall control of the project. He is credited as the producer and advising director after all. Shiggy has a long and well-documented history of not placing story high on his list of priorities, often requesting narrative content to be cut or de-emphasized from certain games he feels doesn't need them. Star Fox Zero is very much one of those games. Leave me alone! While it's true the saga of the Lilat Wars has 95% of the time been contained within the cockpit of some vehicle, and that doesn't lend itself to many narrative opportunities, fans still felt that it was disappointing that this new entry was not going forward in any sort of story capacity. Now, Nintendo pegged the game for a holiday 2015 release date, because by that time the Wii U needed all the help it could get. To expedite this process, the small team within Nintendo would need outside help to get the mission completed. This is because a lot of NCL's internal teams were either working on Breath of the Wild or other projects coming down the pike for the Switch. Therefore, who better than the studio who, in 2013, had asked Nintendo permission to include a Star Fox homage in their own game featuring a leggy witch mommy. Platinum Games and Nintendo co-developed Star Fox Zero from then on out, with most of the design, controls, and overall direction coming from Nintendo, while Platinum handled things like cutscenes, assets, and boss fights. Now, while both companies make vastly different games, you'd think the butting of heads would often occur, but because this was a Nintendo IP and Miyamoto was at the helm, there wasn't much in the way of friction. This is especially true because Hideki, please unblock Matt on Twitter, Kamiya, was not part of the staff. Despite the prolific Windex enthusiast stating several times he wanted to work on a Star Fox title, his duties at the time, such as producing several other projects and having his hands very full with Scalebound, check it out if you haven't, meant he simply couldn't take on another game. Kamiya, of course, is famous for making drastic pivots if he feels it's better for the game in the end. Unhappy with Resident Evil 2? Start over! Feel like RE4 is deviating too sharply? Turn it into Devil May Cry! Sega doesn't want their main character wearing glasses? Well, tell them to fuck off! Who knows what would have happened if Kamiya had been sitting in the Great Fox's command seat, but rest assured, it would have been interesting. In his place was Yusuke Hashimoto, the director of Bayo 2 and Nintendo's Yugo Hayashi, this being his first and only directing credit. However, despite both companies working in tandem, it didn't stop Star Fox Zero from getting delayed, which happened to be a pretty significant one. Nintendo had given a nebulous holiday 2015 date, and by September, they still hadn't nailed it down, so that's when they announced it was going to fly by 2015 entirely and would instead swoop into stores in April of the following year. They then took the time that March to remind people that Project Guard was still a thing, and would now be Star Fox Guard, an extra mode where Slippy was in charge of defending bases from Wave and Wave and Wave and wave of rampaging robots. While novel in its concept, Captain Toad this was not. <laughs> As for the cause of this almost seven month delay, feedback from both Nintendo's Treehouse and E3 2015 was loud and clear. People weren't getting used to the controls. 
According to a source I spoke with, NCL did not want to budge on this, feeling that the control scheme was going to be the main selling point. This is horrible. They did make some concessions though, allowing you to control the R-Wing with the sticks, in addition to aiming with the gamepad gyros, but still would not implement a traditional optional setup. Changes were also applied to the pacing, speed, and difficulty, as originally Miyamoto wanted to offer the game in small episodic chunks, emulating TV shows like Thunderbirds. Internally, many felt this slowed the game's pace way down. And along with the overall speed of the action, everything was then smoothed down and refined. That's right everyone, in case you haven't realized it yet, Star Fox's big return to console gaming was way worse before it released. Unfortunately, it still missed the mark in the end. Zero's reviews in both North America and, well, the rest of the world were pretty savage, keeping it neck and neck with the franchise's worst reviewed game, which was, uh, Assault. What? People didn't want a ton of on-foot missions in a space shooter? I don't believe it! Sales-wise, Zero has the distinction of being the worst-selling entry in the history of the entire series in Japan. And while worldwide sales numbers were never released, several sources have claimed it never even shot down 1 million targets, which for a Nintendo first-party game is pretty depressing. But to be fair, of the 13 million Wii U sold, a sizable percentage of those had probably been sold back to GameStop or whoever wound up taking them. Shigeru Miyamoto, while a legend and responsible for some incredible titles, as well as guiding some second party efforts to great success, really seemed to be holding Star Fox Zero back with certain ideas. If the controls were not ideal, then it would have at least been great to see new characters or a storyline emerge. If that wasn't possible, it would have been equally as awesome for it to play in a more traditional manner. It really brings to mind Nintendo's similar behavior when it comes to another franchise featuring fast, high-powered vehicles that has long been mistreated, and one that fans have politely asked to be brought back. Nintendo! You can't keep me a Mario Kart DLC hell forever! Give me a new F-Zero game, you fuck! If they don't have some grand, innovative idea, then it's apparently not worth pursuing. And while it's great to keep things fresh, if you haven't had a new entry in a particular series for decades, well, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just giving the games a fresh coat of HD paint, storyline, and adding in some online features is all you really need. But Matt, you scream, Star Fox Zero is one of the last games that hasn't been ported to the Switch. Surely it'll be next. Oh, okay, well, let, let's check in with Platinum CEO Etsushi Inaba on the matter. To be honest, we wouldn't have the slightest clue. Star Fox Zero was a bit of a special case for us. Star Fox was, you know, an IP that Nintendo has had way before we entered the picture. That was a game that we were interested in making and kind of just lent out an offer to us. Hey, would you like to work on this with us? As far as the future of any ports or whatever are concerned, no conversations have come our way. I don't think it's something we would be involved in, to be honest. He said this only last year. And while that's not definitive and Nintendo could be working on it in-house, it's not looking especially good at this time. Star Fox Zero very much seemed like the wrong game on the wrong system at the wrong time. But if it did make its way over to the Switch, being able to focus on a singular screen and have optional gyro controls, well, it would be an ideal way for people to re-experience it. But as of right now, it doesn't seem like it's in Nintendo's plans. Can't let you do that, Star Fox. If you know of any other games or movies featuring horrible slash cute animals that went awry, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or fly through the rings of the Flophouse VIP Patreon and become my General Pepper to order me what to take on next. See you next time and thanks for watching!
Now, I know what you're thinking, or about to say. Really, Matt? The Wii U? Isn't that a bit of a dead horse? And to that, I'd say, yes. Yes, it is. So let's beat it! I mean, that's never stopped me before, right? Seriously, though, thanks to Big Boss Leaves McGee down at the Flophouse VIP Patreon for nominating Nintendo's biggest hardware flop of all time. That wasn't in red and black. Now, what was the reason for this? The fall from grace that saw Nintendo going from its most successful, most innovative period to the literal trough of its 100 years of existence. That's not literally, literally, of course. I think the Japanese playing card industry probably saw some rough patches around 1914. Well, to answer that question, there was no reason, no singular reason why the Wii U has now found itself on the newest episode of the show, because its mistakes were varied and oh so numerous. So get out your game pads and blow off the two inch thick blanket of dust because it's time to break down what happened with the Nintendo Wii U. All right, so the deal is that it wasn't very good. <laughs> no, no, I, I've got to perform my due diligence here. It's not like the Wii U was CDI bad or had nothing interesting about it Jaguar bad or barely function R-Zone bad. It's just so many decisions, both big and small, impacted things in ways not everyone could predict. Now, of course, we're going to dig into those poor decisions, but I'm going to say this off the bat. The Wii U had plenty of great games. 90% of them were all coming from Nintendo, and yes, 99% of those are all out now on the Switch, but I'm not sure where I was going with that. E3 2011. Voices are hushed as Reggie fils comes out on stage to show off their next big hardware innovation. Lips are pursed, and balls are quivering throughout the crowd as Reggie proceeds to cut an odd promo that felt more like an obscure riddle than a console introduction. The game will probably still be right for all of us, but could it also be a perfect fit just for you? He then lifted up the game pad, like physically, then a bunch of random no context clips played, and that was it. We're off to a bad start. And you knew it was a bad start because Nintendo's then president, the late great Satoru Iwata, said later that same day, because we put so much emphasis on the controller, there appeared to be some misunderstanding in an interview with the Evening Standard. Now, before we push onwards, let's take a moment right here and state that if you needed to point to just one thing that cursed the Wii U, it's most likely going to be the gamepad, as it was the main source of its many woes for a cornucopia of reasons. It made the marketing murkier. It wasn't the easiest thing to come to grips with, especially if you had baby hands. And because of its design, routinely would make sure that many ports would never see the light of day. So then let's start with that gamepad. In 2006, if you saw a video of a guy swinging the Wii remote and then it cuts to gameplay showing an enemy getting dusted, it's it's pretty clear what the appeal was. If your Nona or Nono clicked a video of someone under handing the Wii remote forward and then saw this, then Nintendo sells 100 million consoles. Those same examples didn't really apply to the gamepad and its functionality. Imagine showing uh, Star Fox Zero or even Nintendo Land to the elderly and expecting something along the same lines. Not quite the same effect. Without that easy to understand concept, Nintendo was already failing to capture the imagination of that super casual audience. You know, the ones who drove the Wii to outsell the hardcore gamer boxes. In addition, unfortunately, Nintendo also very much failed to appeal to that demographic as well. The fans who waited in lines for major releases and actually paid extra for disc protection on their Call of Duties at GameStop. For a console to sell as staggeringly low as the Wii U, you had to appeal to almost no one. The very next E3, Nintendo very much tried to rectify their mistakes and made sure that the Wii U concept was presented as clearly as it could be, but it still wasn't enough. The gamepad was as big as the console itself and still displayed prominently in the marketing, and it had a screen, so even at a glance, potential customers still had no idea what they were looking at. And while you could see glimpses of 
what Nintendo was going for with the asymmetrical nature of, say, Luigi's Ghost Mansion, it wasn't nearly as appealing as aiming Link's bow and arrow, or turning the wheel of an Excite truck, or better yet, Excite Bot. <laughs> then there was the major issue of third party support. Heading into launch, some publishers were throwing some weight behind the machine, putting out ports of games that the Wii would never have seen. Stuff like Darksiders 2, Ninja Gaiden 3, Razor's Edge, and probably most famously of all, Batman Arkham City, featuring armor from the Armored Edition franchise. Now while all of those are competent action games, none of them were made for the Wii U specifically in mind, so many critics and fans pointed out their ho-hum tacked on implementations of the gamepad. What was the reason for this? Well, it was due to the fact that they were all tacked on implementations of the gamepad. In the case of Armored Edition, it would simply give Batwoman and Catman a slightly different armored skin, letting you tap the screen at the right moment, giving them a slight boost to attack power and speed, and well, that's it. The Wii U was always saddled with these unimpressive ports throughout its lifetime, with very few of them ever being better than what you'd see on competing machines, and pundits pointed this out nice and early, especially when it came to Arkham. When questioned about the value of these ports, and how many of them had been available on 360s and PS3s for months, Reggie fils gifted us with the then very quotable quote, It's not the same game. It's not the same content, despite it being the exact same game. What didn't help matters is that oftentimes these Wii U ports would tend to be worse in certain regards, as the nature of the gamepad required developers to allocate precious RAM towards it, resulting in the actual Wii U console being slightly less powerful than Microsoft or Sony's products. The other aspect of Wii U development that scared off these same third parties from making exclusives was that unlike the Wii, developing for the Wii U could be just as or more expensive as any late gen 360 or PS3 title, which was an advantage the Wii always had. Typically, developing for the two GameCubes duct taped together would be a cheaper option, and the Wii Remote and Nunchuck provided a lot of distinct methods of play, which you could see in the genres that typically excelled on the console. But the Wii U was always a much tougher sell. The gamepad's limited touchscreen capability, combined with its standard buttons, made it harder for studios to think of unique or practical uses for it. However, one of the best and very few examples of a third party succeeding here was with Ubisoft's Zombie U, having to frantically juggle supplies and items by looking down at the gamepad while zombies are coming at you in the unpaused gameplay of your main screen was a pretty novel way to utilize the Wii U's concept. However, implementations like this were few and far between. Most software outside of Nintendo simply used the gamepad to look at maps select weapons, and various other shortcuts, which of course was hardly changing the entire landscape of gaming like its predecessor had. It's almost as if the Wii U arrived just at the best time to make the least amount of impact. Tablets and mobile gaming were obviously booming with the mainstream, the Xbox One and PS4 were being anticipated by, for lack of a better term, the hardcore, but instead of serving both of those groups, it really wound up serving neither. The Wii U had designed design philosophies taken from modern slash traditional video game tech, but also less complicated and casual focus control methods. It wasn't any one thing, truly a homunculus that had no idea why it was created. So while that covers the techie and design philosophy stuff, it actually took a lot of teamwork and many more helping hands for the Wii U to become a failure. So to outline a few of those, I'd like to invite Scottsworth Washington III to our stage as he has, in agonizing detail, covered many of Nintendo's foibles in the past. Hey all, Matt there. I never get a chance to complain about the Wii U, so I'm so happy for this opportunity. So yeah, let's start with the name itself, the Wii U. That was a whole other problem. Honestly, while anyone can understand from a marketing perspective that reusing the Wii branding was uh, pretty much the safest, most financially secure thing you could do, the console wasn't really a follow-up to the Wii in a traditional sense. In fact, the actual white wonder stick that was the Wii Remote was relegated as a secondary or well, even tertiary control option and saw very little usage in the Wii U's library. So it was always a mystifying and confusing name to most Everybody. Neato burrito. So it's the Wii too? Cool. Well, uh, where's the remote thing? Where 
Where did that go? Uh, no, yeah, you, uh, you use this big, bulky, uh, tablet thing that has, like, 18 buttons now. Oh. Now, Nintendo did try to clarify what the name Wii U even meant. It's a system we will all enjoy together, but also one that's tailor-made for you. But it didn't really mean anything at all. Like, if you really wanted to keep the Wii brand going, why not call it the Wii 2 Wii HD Ultra Wii? Available for your home in 1995. Call me on Nintendo Ultra Wii. That's at least a bit clearer than throwing a dart at the wall, landing on the letter U, and slapping that bad boy on the end. And yeah, while hindsight is 2020, the far better option would have probably been to simply release a true Wii follow up, make it HD, give it more horsepower, upgrade the remote and nunchuck with new features, improve the motion sensing even further. I mean, the answer was sitting there right in front of their face. This is definitely one of those times where Nintendo's desire to innovate took over the desire to make a product that had practical appeal and was easy to understand. Say what you will about Waggle, but there was a number of solid games that used IR aiming to great effect, and it was definitely a missed opportunity for Nintendo to not reiterate that further. Sure, simply upgrading the standard Wii wasn't taking any risks, and the last time Nintendo didn't take any risks was with the GameCube, their poor selling home console, until the Wii U. But sometimes that's okay. You don't need to reinvent the wheel every five years. I mean, the wagon's fine with the wheels it's got right now, okay? But I guess with the runaway success of the Wii, Nintendo thought they couldn't rest on their laurels, so it's kind of understandable why they wanted to shake things up, even if they didn't need to. Damn, I mean, even Nintendo employees thought the name was an issue, because in 2014, Nintendo's ex-head of indies, Dan Aldman, shared his truth with the world. Wii U is not selling as well as it deserves to. It has a lot to offer with great games you can't get anywhere else. The value of the game pad hasn't been justified, but the name Wii U is abysmal. I think that cuts sales in half right there. He said this like a day after he quit Nintendo, of course. Then finally, there was the cost. Typically, not a problem with Nintendo consoles. They're usually priced fairly, but when stacked against the competition at the time, it kind of was. When the Wii U launched in late 2012, the baby package, which was just the console, one gamepad, and eight massive gigs of storage space, retailed for $299 US dollars. If you had a large penis and opted for the big baller deluxe package, you got a dizzying 32 gigs, one gamepad, Nintendo Land, and a bunch of random accessories, which would set you back another 50 clamps. Conversely, that same year, the PS3 and 360 were still getting major games, and both Microsoft and Sony were offering tempting alternatives to new customers. There were two Xbox-flavored bundles, a casual one that included a 4-gig Xbox 360 with a Kinect sensor, Kinect Adventures, and Kinect Disneyland Adventures for $249, and a 250-gig option with a physical copy of Forza 4 and a digital download voucher for Skyrim, Hey, you, are finally awake. Also for $249. If you felt, however, that only a Sony console could quench your thirst, well, they announced a super slim PS3 that was loaded up with 500 gigs of space and came with a copy of Uncharted 3 for a cool $269. All of these deals, through sheer mathematics, presented more value than either Wii U package. And that's just facts. Finally, aside from the one $50 price drop for the deluxe bundle a year later in a half-hearted attempt to combat the Xbox One and PS4, the Wii U remained at $299 for the rest of its days, ensuring that the thing would never see any sales spikes again. A uh, bold decision by Nintendo there for reasons I can't even imagine. So yeah, in summary, the Wii U is a land of contrast. Thank you. And with that, I have to run. I have to complain about the Wii U in the other room. Why, thank you, Scott, for that scintillating breakdown. If you are not familiar with Scotty Too Hotty's work, make sure to check out his channel at your earliest convenience. But uh, after this video, please keep watching. I'm not even done yet. Now, aside from marketing and price issues, there was also a lack of palatable marquee titles for the Wii U. And I'm not just talking about the third-party offerings like Mortal Kombat, Street Fighter, Castlevania, Metal Gear, Bioshock, Grand Theft Auto, or Tomb Raider, but franchises from Nintendo themselves. There was no Metroid, Fire Emblem, its own exclusive Zelda, a traditional single-player-only Mario, Punch-Out, Animal Crossing, or F-Zero. But what am I talking about? F-Zero skips every Nintendo console. All this to say that if you were a long-time gamer that grew up with some of these very notable series and only owned a Wii U, well, your gaming library was probably pretty thin. 
Now, I know this has been mostly doom and gloom, like every article ever written about Nintendo when they get some stuff wrong, but it's not all bad when it comes to the Wii U, just mostly bad. Where it did make big strides in was with indie games. Compared to the archaic Wii Shop channel, the quality of independent titles grew exponentially on the Wii U, which was largely due to Nintendo having gotten rid of their draconian size limits and sales thresholds. While it offered a good many releases you saw on other machines, like Guacamelee, there were a few standout console exclusives, like the intriguing Year Walk or the criminally underappreciated Tengami. Keeping the positive train a choo choo chewing, Nintendo made sure to lift the biggest positive from the Wii U, that being the Amiibo. While Toys to Life in general has long since died, the Amiibo still persevere, obviously due to Smash Brothers, but they still have value outside of that in some specific cases. Just as a reminder, if you yourself stopped buying Amiibo, or always thought they were stupid, they're not, they're still cool, Nintendo sold over 40 million of these things and still counting. Amiibo were literally more successful than the console that birthed them, and whenever new ones are announced, there's still a fervor amongst collectors to have them. The other highlight of the console has to be Miiverse, which offered a much more human, interactive, and bizarre community experience than the kind of uncreative machine-like interfaces you'd find on the Xbox or PlayStation. Personally, if there is one other thing they could have brought over to the Switch, it was the insanity of Miiverse. The Wii U sold less than 15 million consoles worldwide over the course of four years, and to put that in perspective, the PS4 outsold that in one. So it would be no surprise that in January of 2016, Nintendo discontinued it, with its last official game being Breath of the Wild, which was a nice send off, but you know, it, it was the worst version. <laughs> Games are still coming out for it though, with V Blank Entertainment's wacky open world action game Shakedown Hawaii, which released physically in August of this year, the absolute mad lads. Wrapping up, Reggie himself in 2016 even commented on where Nintendo went astray. When we launched Wii U, we missed the opportunity to be clear on the concept, to show off its capabilities and what the users could do. And that hurt us. Sales were also hurt during the beginning of its lifespan by the lack of games. And although we've sold 13 million consoles against 20 and 40 million from the competition, Microsoft and Sony respectively, what pleases us the most is that the Wii U has the games with the best reviews and ratings from fans. And he's not technically wrong because almost all of the titles that Nintendo published on the Trouble console were indeed highly reviewed, so there's that I guess. At the end of the day, the Wii U's failure is what informed Nintendo to perfect the idea with the Switch, creating a slimmer, more convenient machine that still retained many of its innovations, and even some from the Wii as well. Unfortunately, the Wii U itself is now in this very weird nebulous state where it barely needs to exist at all, since its most popular popular games have been brought over to its infinitely more successful successor. In fact, there's only three major wholly original Nintendo-owned titles that have yet to be ported, those being Xeno Chronicles X, Star Fox Zero, and Fatal Frame 5 Legend of the Great Wetness or whatever that was called. If or when those get ported, then yeah, I'm not sure why anyone would- Oh wait! I forgot, I forgot about Devil's Third. Okay, yeah, never mind. Keep your Wii U's on 24 seven to experience Itagaki's magnum opus, cause uh, no one's ever porting that. Thanks again to Sleeves McGee for his nomination, and if you know of any other console calamities, post it up in the comments below, go over to the Meverse that is my Twitter account, or flail your way over to the Flophouse VIP Patreon to put forward what you'd like to see in a future episode. See you next time, and thanks for watching! Welcome back to another episode of What Happened, the show that semi-regularly makes you say, oh yeah, that game. Speaking of which, let me present to you the 2005 GameCube classic, Geist. 
told you I'd be back. I'm tough to kill. Was Nintendo trying to make the Metroid Prime lightning strike twice? Was it their Halo killer? Nope. Or was it just an oddball FPS destined to live alongside Odama and future tactics uprising at the bottom of the bargain bins? Well, expand your mind and attach your soul to a dish of dog food. It's time to find out what happened to Geist. It's about time. The tale of this perilous paranormal project starts with N-Space, an Orlando studio originally financed by Sony Computer Entertainment of America to develop games for the PS1, which they very much did, because these games were PlayStation as shit. Bug Riders, Duke Nukem Land of the Babes, Danger Girl, and a copious amount of Olsen Twins titles. Ashley, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore. No kidding, Mary-Kate. Now, I know there are two schools of thought here, but they're both wrong. Sweet 16 License to Drive was a massive improvement on Magical Mystery Mall. <laughs> That's just facts. So I started out on Mary-Kate and Ashley, which was great fun. Anyway, SCEA didn't actually own N-Space, and somewhere between Mary-Kate and Ashley titles, <laughs> they heard that Nintendo of America, possibly due to the success of Metroid Prime, what? had put out a call for a first-person game that wasn't just following shooter trends. N-Space higher-ups caught wind of this and immediately started brainstorming a concept to sell. They came up with multiple ideas, but settled on one that, while appearing to be a standard FPS at first glance, had a hidden twist. In a 2005 interview with Planet GameCube, now Nintendo World Report, N-Space president Eric Dyke explained. One of the ideas we liked was an idea about playing an invisible agent like an invisible man that would use guns and because they're invisible, they would be able to scare and intimidate people. Some people liked it, some people felt something was missing. We came up with a variation on it that basically says, what if you're a ghost? And if you need a weapon, you possess a person that has a gun. Or if you need a pair of hands, you possess someone who can do manual work. From there, it kind of snowballed. Also, the ghost aspect still gave us a voyeuristic scare and messing with people aspect that we liked about the invisible idea. As for a name, the team were looking at the straightforward but marketable fear, but apparently had to abandon it because of the no fear clothing line. With that one shot down, they then arrived at Geist, which was another name that they had been considering. After landing on this concept, they self-funded a prototype with the explicit goal of getting Nintendo's attention, which they absolutely did. Nintendo of America felt like the idea had plenty of promise, and their Japanese HQ, known as Nintendo Co. Limited or NCL, felt the same once they got their hands on it. N-Space would spend the next six months in an experimentation phase, working together with NCL, fleshing out new ideas, and even getting a lot of insight and feedback from Shigeru Miyamoto himself. Miyamoto found the possession mechanics interesting, imagine that, and brought up the idea of possessing inanimate objects in addition to the meat puppets already controllable in the earlier builds. Miyamoto had immediately commented on an idea of object possession. When the team had first heard, they didn't know exactly what he meant. They kind of thought he might just be joking around, apparently he has that kind of sense of humor in the workplace. Eventually, Miyamoto-san just said, I think the possession aspect of this game is great, and I want to know what it's like to not just possess humans and animals, but what it would be like to possess a box, or what it would be like to possess a plant. During one of NCL's visits, it became a priority to do some experimentation with object possession, and then figure out how to fit that into the game we were already developing. That was a little bit of a curveball. It added some work onto things, but we're really happy where it ended up. Nintendo felt what they had was good enough to show at their E3 2003 show, and their press release for Geist stated that it was going to be part of that year's holiday lineup, which it would famously miss by a lot. In fact, Geist would actually take almost two more years to start haunting GameCube disc trays. In that same Planet GameCube interview, Eric Dyke elaborated on what caused this series of delays, going from winter 2003 to 2004 to its final release in summer of 2005. According to him, NCL and NSpace saw the game in two different lights. 
To end space, it was a first-person shooter with a possession mechanic, whereas Ninty saw an adventure game with some first-person shooting. Since Nintendo was calling the shots, much of the game was redesigned over time to be more in line with their vision, doubling down on all the ghostly aspects. Instead of levels where you were running and or gunning through enemies, occasionally possessing a guard or an engineer along the way, much of Geiss' gameplay started revolving around environmental puzzles. Ted Newman further explained how this readjusting of the core gameplay elements took a lot of trial and error. There would be times where they would ask us to add something to the game that Nintendo staff thought of. Sometimes we would just scratch our heads a little and say, well, we're not quite sure how that's going to work. But Nintendo is very big on experimentation, and a lot of times they want to put something in the game to see it. And sure enough, just about everything they did ask us to add, we got to the point where it was in the game and we got to play it that we said, wow, that does work. Now, something that's interesting overall about Geiss' development is that despite massive delays and, spoilers, eventual failure at retail, Endspace staff routinely describe the process of working so closely with Nintendo very positively, expressing that the partnership was genuinely good for the game, while regarding Geiss as a truly shared product, and that the development process was a wonderful experience, which doesn't happen too often on this show. While the gameplay was getting overhauled, big changes were also coming to the story and its protagonist, John Ramey. Endspace had initially gone with a gruff, battle-hardened agent, citing Jack Bauer as a major source of inspiration. That would explain everything. Nintendo, however, felt the character should be more of an everyman with very little combat experience, allowing him and the player to grow together as the game went on. This meant that John went from super soldier to super nerd, being rewritten as a civilian scientist, with the new idea being that when he possessed characters, he would take on their traits or skills, positioning him as more of a blank slate. The story and style of Geist was also pretty cinematic, especially for a game published by Nintendo. Aside from outliers like Eternal Darkness, elaborate cutscenes were rare offerings from the publisher, and they typically didn't splurge on well-known voice actors at the time either. Geist, however, was no exception to that last one. This is something that Ted Newman explained. Actually, we were really lucky to have a contract with a local radio station called Real Radio 104.1. It's all talk radio. We approached them and said, listen, we want to see if you want to audition for the voices. We've got a couple of hosts from several of the shows. I think there is like four shows that go on throughout the day. We thought they did a great job. Mm, did they though? The rift, it's, it's collapsed. The simulation is ready to initialize, sir. Man, I'm having a bad day. By March of 2005, Geist was finally coming together and was locked into a specific but also vague June release date. Once June rolled around, Nintendo informed websites and retailers once again that Geist was going to see another delay, this time to its actual final release dates of August 15th in North America, October 7th for Europe, November 3rd for Australia, and never for Japan. Looking at the big picture here, Geist was absolutely Endspace's most ambitious game to date, marking their first attempt at actual unique IP. Unfortunately, this still manifested very little fanfare and only just mixed reviews. Despite the ghostly gameplay hook, Possession was routinely cited by critics and fans alike as an element that grew formulaic since you were mostly doing the same things over and over to progress. Most also felt that the FPS action was middling and half-baked, and lacked a lot of the impact and polish seen in other successful FPSs of the day. In terms of graphics and performance, Geist was also considered an underachiever. Endspace were still using a custom engine that they had originally built for the PlayStation 1, which may have limited their ability to fully reach the graphical benchmark that folks expected from major GameCube releases. And while Geist's ideas received plenty of praise, it was felt that the two gameplay styles didn't mesh very well, with neither feeling particularly polished. Now, despite Endspace staff apparently happy with their intimate Nintendo partnership, the split focus would ultimately deliver a title that couldn't satisfy either half of the gameplay premise. Now, on to the topic of sales. Well, Geist was dead on arrival. 
<laughs> oh, what was I laughing at now? According to NPD Group, Geist failed to meet the top 20 for both the month of its release and the subsequent months as well. Even more damning is that it also failed to crack the NPD's top 10 GameCube only charts, which were printed in Nintendo Power at the time. Heavy hitters like Madden 2006 and Mario Superstar Baseball were topping those charts, with Geist placing below stuff like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, and even years-old evergreen titles like Animal Crossing, Kirby Air Ride, and Pokemon Coliseum. Scanning through Nintendo's investor reports for that fiscal year, Geist is only ever mentioned twice, with both those instances just being the release dates for North America and Europe. That's not great. And Space, for their part, seemed to be trying to move forward with Geist regardless. Rumors of a Nintendo DS version were circulating at the time and were then later confirmed genuine when people cracked open the files for the N-Space developed Call of Duty 4 for the Nintendo DS. Obviously, nothing came of this, and before too long, N-Space were back to doing grunt work for other studios. They would focus mostly on a surprisingly well-regarded string of Call of Duty and 007 portables, among others. This conveyor belt of licensed games continued until 2012, where they would get to work on their first original IP ever since Geist, this time under Square Enix. Some of you out there might remember the unmemorable Heroes of Ruin for the Nintendo 3DS, an incredibly generic co-op dungeon crawler tested by yours truly. While it was well made and mechanically solid with a robust online mode to boot, it generally didn't resonate with a good percentage of reviewers who collectively scored it a nice 69 average on Metacritic. Dan O'Leary, N-Space CEO, even publicly said that he felt the 3DS's low install base at the time contributed to the game's commercial failure. Personally, I feel the bland art style and lukewarm reviews were more to blame, but this was back around the time when the 3DS was only finally recovering from its rough launch period, so there's probably a nugget of truth in his statement somewhere. Times were getting tough for N-Space, as evidenced by their last two titles. Firstly, a WWE mobile game of some kind, WWE Champion, Supercard, I don't know, I can never keep those two straight. And then secondly, and lastly, Sword Coast Legends, a D&D licensed game developed alongside Digital Extremes, which wasn't received much better. In fact, it was even worse, and very much did not save the company. In 2016, they announced they had closed their doors before the console versions of Sword Coast Legends had ever even come out. This was a bit of a weird one, I ain't gonna lie. While Nintendo were clearly hoping to capture the same magic Metroid Prime had conjured, John Ramey ain't no Samus, and possessing a bowl of dog food isn't quite as compelling as navigating a morph ball maze. It wasn't the most marketable game, and its multiple delays may have pushed it too far out to make much of an impact. While it failed to resonate with the mainstream audiences, though, at least Geiss's memory lives on in Smash Brothers Ultimate as- Oh, what? Oh, no assist trophy! Like, like at all! There's not even any spirits! Oh, that- Oh! If you know of any other ghostly gambles, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter- Wait, 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 wait! Hang on! If you change the language of Smash Ultimate to German- Sakurai, you madman, you did it again! Or come haunt the halls of the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate what you want to see in the future. See you next time, and thanks for watching! Mm -hmm.